taken leading up to this moment as well as actions we're taking going forward. I talked about the public engagement process that led to the appointment of Chief Buckner. I referenced a number of the policy changes that we've made uh, over the past year or so since Chief Buckner's been uh, in his position, including a new use of force policy adopted last summer, a uh, new body-worn camera policy, and a new transgender policy. Uh, I uh, also want to reference um, our administration's uh, active opposition to the U.S. Department of Justice's efforts to dissolve a uh, consent decree relative to minority hiring and promotion. It's an important tool that we are going to continue to fight for. Uh, officer discipline. Uh, two examples. One, uh, Chief Buckner has overhauled the Office of Professional Standards, or what is otherwise known as Internal Affairs. It's changed leadership, increased staffing, and move, physically moved the, the office from the public safety building, which we had received complaints about f people feeling comfortable going into, moved it into City Hall Commons on the same floor as the Citizen Review Board to be more accommodating. Uh, also, we, we have sought to replace our current uh, our system of arbitration for discipline uh, with a transparent process involving public hearings, uh, and that is currently being litigated uh, by the, um, between the city and the police union and fire union. Um, those are just a few examples of things that we worked on, uh, we've worked on since Chief Buckner's came into office. Is a direct response to the, uh, whether we want to call them demands uh, or uh, requests of uh, the people's agenda for police reform, just to touch on each of them briefly. The first one uh, is again asking us to review the use of force policy that we adopted last year. We are going to do that. Second is asking us to enhance the body camera, uh, body worn camera policy. Uh, and we, uh, we do intend to do that. We can get into details. Uh, each of those items were addressed in my executive order uh, that, uh, that I issued two weeks ago. Third uh, was to publicize the Pol Police Benevolent Association Union contract as is. Uh, we we uh, posted that. I think I see some uh, images in the back of that along with the clean copy that when we as an administration came in and saw what condition it was in, drafted a clean copy that was uh, never signed by the PBA. And then we also posted uh, the, the uh, contract that the administration and the PBA agreed to, which was ultimately voted down by the council. All three of those documents can be found on syracusepolice.org. Uh, and again, in direct response to, uh, to the demands. Uh, fourth uh, is a request to pass legislation to strengthen and enhance the uh, Syracuse Citizens Review Board. Uh, I did address uh, a component of that within our, our executive order, uh, including uh, the, the chief uh, agreeing to uh, take the CRB recommendations into consideration before making a final determination on discipline for an officer. Uh, any legislation related to the CRB will, would be taken up by the Common Council and Council President Hudson uh, can speak to that if she'd like. Uh, fifth was to demilitarize the SPD. Uh, in my executive order, I've, I've called for a complete inventory of all equipment acquired through military surplus programs, and we will establish policies and procedures for the use and procurement of such equipment, or non-use for that matter. Uh, six, redirect resources away from SPD to reinvest uh, in human resources and other services. In the executive order, we, uh, I called for researching and considering innovative community-based strategies for responding to non-criminal calls with the goal of shifting the paradigm from primary police response to response by non-police professionals in relevant fields. If we shift responsibilities, we'll shift resources. Number seven, uh, uh, research uh, draft introduce and pass legislation for public oversight of surveillance technologies, including but not limited to a ban on biometric and facial recognition technologies. Protecting people's privacy is a priority for this administration. It has been from uh, the time we started, including as we've rolled out our smart city initiatives, and we welcome the opportunity to work with the council on such legislation. Uh, and finally, uh, in response to uh, a call to immediately remove school resource officers out of schools in the executive order, we have, uh, uh, we intend to develop and implement in coordination with the Syracuse City School District a new model for school safety and security, which will ultimately decide uh, what, uh, if any, role uh, the Syracuse Police Department will have with city schools. And of course, we have the superintendent and school board in attendance who can talk more about that. Uh, that's a quick overview. I pr probably went over my two minutes, but I'm uh, happy to talk more, uh, more about any of those in greater length ev after everyone has a chance to, to speak. Uh, I guess, uh, Yusuf, you can call on who you'd like next. Thank Just you. in the interest of uh, making sure we're most efficient, um, I put a timer, so I'm going to 
give you all an additional 30 seconds. Uh, so you have a minute and 30 seconds. Um, and I think in each of you, your capacities are a lot more limited uh, than the mayor's has been. Uh, so I think it's a little fairer to give you a little bit more time. Um, so whoever wants to go next on the spectrum, uh, you can raise your hand and then I'll start the timer once, uh, once you have begun speaking. Please, yep. With regard to technology, we currently have a position open with the city of Syracuse, our chief, chief data officer position. That position look, oversees all of the data analysis for the city of Syracuse and also because of all the technology that is um, being incorporated by the city of Syracuse is also, will be also part of developing policy around how we use that technology or what we procure. Um, I wanted to say in this setting that we are seeking a chief data officer as we speak. Um, with regard to the body-worn cameras, I just also want to add that we have legislation prepared to come before the council for their next study session and their next vote um, to actually be able to um, pur purchase the next phase of the cameras to equip our patrol officers. You good, Deputy Mayor? Anything else? Are you good? Okay. Council President? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I had written that down because the council is working to ensure that all officers have body-worn cameras so that we'll have it in real time. And we're also working to find a way to install dash cams because we have very few dash cams on any of our police cars. And I think that's going to be um, very vital. And what we've done so far, we're working on section 1411 because we know that in that section it gives the council powers to be able to look at the number of police officers on the police force. So we're working on that section. Excuse me. 2013, um, we put in a resolution that we put in every year, and I'm going to ask for your help here, um, that we asked the state to take away their 1936 waiver that allows police officers to not have to live in the city they serve. We have asked them every year since I've been on council to remove that waiver. Um, we are gonna be actually investigative reports. They will be delivered to the council so that we can actually see what's taking place when these investigations are done. Um, I talked about the body cameras and I talked about the state and basically, we're just working with um, different organizations, Yusuf, and we're working together to try to bring some of these policies, especially in Section 5, we're trying to do, bring some of those to the council so that we can write legislation on these policies. Because understand that city council, we can vote down things for departments, but we have no direct control over the police department. So all we can do is write legislation and offer our opinion because we don't have direct control over the police department. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council President. Yeah. Mayor, I've just been informed that the problem has been corrected and we're live. We're live on our city YouTube channel. Yes. Okay, very good. All right, well, folks will have multiple opportunities to, to view this live. And again, we are recording it. We'll make that available. I, I do want to just say, uh, that something that the council and the administration are committed to working on is the full implementation of the uh, of the right to know legislation that has been previously discussed. Chief Buckner. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, I certainly uh, appreciate uh, the, the opportunity to en engage in, in this uh, exercise. I, I think it's very, very important uh, given the times that we're in. Uh, I do not want it to be lost or think that it, um, as a chief that I, you do not know that I appreciate the way our city has handled uh, police reform and, and what has occurred uh, post George Floyd uh, because many cities have um, taken a much more um, destructive path uh, that, that to this destination that we're all seeking uh, and it has not been lost on me that our city uh, lar in large uh, has not subscribed to that and I greatly appreciate that. Uh, you will not see the police department kicking and screaming uh, as we're going through police reform. Uh, we view this as an opportunity. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the vast majority of the things either in part 
or in whole are already a part of uh, a process in which we were engaged uh, called the 21st century policing principles. Uh, and they are building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology and social media, community policing and crime reduction, training and education, officer wellness and safety. Uh, the things that, uh, that we've had in, in the form of demands in one way or another uh, fit most of those categories uh, and we look forward to having our place at the table as we continue uh, down this path. Chief. Superintendent. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, Jaime Alicea, Superintendent of the Syracuse City School District. Uh, I have been with the district for 37 years and I have had the honor to teach some of the people in the audience this afternoon. So thank you for being here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I am always welcome the opportunity to engage in open dialogue on how can we work together to address the needs of the kids in the district and the needs that we have in our community. Uh, during my tenure as a superintendent in the Circuit City School District, I have worked closely with uh, many community agencies and also with the police department. Uh, we had an issue with that one police officers and in collaboration with the police department, I was able to remove that police officer from our school. So that was one of the things that we have done in the past in the district. One of the things that we are gonna be doing this month, we are uh, presenting a policy, an anti-racism policy to the Board of Education. We have formed a coalition uh, for anti-racism that we have different groups having discussion about what is happening not only in our community, but in our nation. Uh, we continue to monitor the work that our police officers are doing in our school. And before any police officer comes to provide services in our school, to be a school resource officer, they have to be trained. And we wanted to make sure that that took place so the Syracuse City School District pays for that training. In order for them to be SRO in our school, we want them to be trained. Uh, we are also a, working on a survey that we're gonna send to our students, families, and staff about the role of the police officers and uh, the future of the police officers in our school. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm here to listen to your experiences and your concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And we have our school board president, Katie Sojowitz. Uh, good evening, everyone. I wanted to say thank you for including me in this discussion. Um, I'm grateful to everyone here and everyone watching, but I do have to say that I'm especially grateful to the young people who are part of this movement. I think um, it's especially moving to me to see you know, students from our high schools or recent graduates from our high schools. So if you are in the audience or if you're watching, just a special thanks to you. Um, uh, we know on the board, as I'm, I'm here to represent the board, we know that we need to listen, but we also know that that's not enough to just listen. We know that there needs to be action attached to that and that there needs to be a plan. And while tonight I won't be able to give you a specific timeline, I can tell you that um, we are putting on our next agenda which, uh, for our work session that we are having this discussion as a full board. Um, and in addition, uh, like Superintendent Elisea said, we are um, committed to having written policies because I, we don't believe it's enough to just say what we believe we need to have it written down because then that holds all of us, especially at the board level, accountable for not just what we say but our practices, especially in terms of anti-racism and equity. And then I just wanted to close and say um, that it's a real testament to this administration and to the superintendent that they're willing to work together to um, move forward to see what the model needs to look like in our schools in terms of resources for our students. And it, it's really heartening as a resident of the city, as a parent, and as a school board member to have everyone working together. Thank you. Thank you, and I just want to uplift the fact that I want to be um, appreciative to the folks who are here, uh, who are making sure that I would push back with one thing. We do list them as demands because I think we want to be explicit to say that this is what we as a community are demanding of our uh, representatives. Uh, it's not a request, it's not a recommendation, it's not an ask, it's not a benevolent action, it's really a demand. Um, and we want to be explicit about that in the terminology that we use uh, because it's because of the demand that we are here today. Um, and but not for that, uh, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so just, I just want to make that clear. 
Uh, I have to call one person who is going to be the first person. Um, his name is Genghis Khalid Muhammad. Genghis couldn't be here because he's wheelchair bound. Uh, and so I want to make sure that he's able to participate and he will be the first person. Uh, so if you can just give me a second, I'm going to give him a call. Um, Yusuf, while you're calling him, if there are any recent uh, written statements, can you submit those? Absolutely. Okay. Great. Are you ready to speak? Okay, one second. Um, so... You're, yes, you're about to be connected right now. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to put you on speaker and... Uh, yes, sir. Okay, putting you on speakerphone. Genghis, uh, you are live. Okay, so um, this is regarding uh, the police accountability and their uh, abuse and uh, intimidation and terrorism uh, pertaining to black people in general. I had an experience in Syracuse, New York about some five years ago at one of my granddaughter's uh, place homes where I was staying in for a while and what happened was the police, they came into the house looking for a, a certain party that never even was there and they came in brandishing their guns. They had the I don't know whether you call them sword or shotguns or whatever, but that's what they had. Genghis, are you still here? Yeah. Sorry, uh, were you, did you have anything you also wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, I think he's having technical issues. Um, so I can summarize what he, in effect, was saying to us last night uh, and in our discussion on Tuesday. Uh, Genghis is a 66-year-old man. Uh, he said, and this is really relevant to the issues about police citizen encounters. Um, when an officer shows up at your door or you engage with a police officer, the expectation is you're treated with respect, that you're treated with decency, and that you have a constitutional right to know why you're being stopped and why you're being searched. In this instance, police officers came into his niece's, uh, his granddaughter's apartment, as he expressed, showed up with weapons, brandished people with those weapons, did not explain why they were there, didn't articulate clearly or effectively what they were looking for, um, showed up, and as a 66-year-old man, he has children and grandchildren the age of many of those officers. What this story points to, um, as Genghis articulates better than I can, is the type of experiences that people engage with law enforcement on a regular basis. Whether you are a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old in a school, or you are a 66-year-old person in your pajamas in your home, the way with which law enforcement engages with people is with impunity, with denigration, with disrespect, and without a basic level of human decency. White supremacy. Um, and to be clear, I don't think I reject using the word racism. Um, it's important to be anti-racist, but using the terminology white supremacy puts in context what we're talking about. And we have to be clear about what we're talking about. Um, and in Genghis' perspective, in his mind as a 66-year-old man, how dare you come into my granddaughter's house? By the way, I actually find the wrong, you're not in the right house, which has happened, and as we know with Breonna Taylor, is evidenced with the way with which law enforcement engages in communities of color, shoot up people's homes, and don't get held accountable for it. What we asked for a year ago was something very simple, a law that's called the Right to Know Act. The Right to Know Act addresses police citizen encounters. We asked this a year ago. We drafted legislation. I want to correct the record because it is not the New York City law, which is what the executive order talks about it as. It's actually a Syracuse law based off of the Syracuse City Charter because we had many attorneys do research and provide an analysis. And we reject the idea 
that the Corporation Council asserts that the Common Council doesn't have the legal authority to actually legislate on this issue. You absolutely do, and I urge you, and we all urge you, to get your own counsel because she is not acting in the interest of the council as an independent arbiter. In her position, she has spoken in a way, and I want to be clear that I'm speaking about in her position, in her official capacity, not as an individual. I don't know her from anybody else in the wall. I know her as the corporation counsel, what I have read from her articles in the newspaper, what she has asserted in the public, and we have seen the response that we will share publicly the Right to Know Act is a law that basically deals with when an officer engages a citizen, you have the right to know why they're stopping you, why you're being searched, who is stopping you, if they're charging with an offense, what they're charging you with, have a business card, and where you can go to file a complaint. It is nothing extenuous. It isn't, quite frankly, the most radical of reforms. It is simply customer relations. And for a year, this has been in Corporation Council's possession, and there has been obfuscation, there has been delay, and in fact, Mayor, we met with you, as you know, and you ordered them to expedite this, and it has not happened. And so when we say we are demanding a people's agenda for policing, we are saying this because we cannot trust the promises that are made, because they don't pan out. They do not come to fruition. When we have lobbied and respectably gotten into rooms, wrote the legislation, engaged in community, did the research, asked you what they want to do, had people, as you know, call the council chambers, we have done all of the work in a very respectable, respectable, calm process. And it is because we are now demanding, which is why we're saying the words demand, why we're demanding not an executive order that says we will address the principles, but the exact language that have been articulated in our legislation. If the council doesn't have authority, there should be nothing that precludes the mayor from being able to do exactly what is written, and that is what we're asking for. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Croom, who is an attorney with Legal Services in Central New York and is a part of SPARC, which is Syracuse Police Accountability and Reform Coalition, is going to come up uh, and uh, talk to the use of force policy and perhaps also some issues around right to not. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. That was uh, the most important context of, of why I work with Spark, why I'm here tonight to talk about what Spark has been pushing in the past year, specifically around the use of force policy. A year ago, on June 28th, there was a public forum at St. Lucie's Church. Everyone, I think, in this room was there. You heard the stories of the terror that the police are putting on the black and brown community in Syracuse. At that forum, thank you. At that forum, we provided a 17-page document analyzing the use of force uh, policy and giving recommendations about how that could be improved. It was very specific. It was written clearly where you could have taken it and you could have put it right into the new policy. We also provided again to you, Mr. Mayor, on June or July 23rd of last summer. It's been a year and nothing has happened with the use of force policy. So I'm here tonight to ask, did you receive our analysis? And did you read our analysis? And it, Sorry, you just answer, I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. And if you're committed to the reforms that you've, that you've talked about, and for the past year you've talked about the use of force policy and how you've reviewed it and changed it and how this this big reform but then when we show you that it's not enough nothing happens mm -hmm. so i want to hear from you tonight about what commitments you can make to take our analysis our recommendations and put them into the use of force policy and we believe that syracuse should be a model for the united states that we should be the best practice and I would like to hear your thoughts. Do you think the use of force policy now is a best practice model? Do you think it's the gold standard of use of force policies? Okay. So to be clear, the, the time frame in which you're referring to was around the time frame in which we updated our use of force policy. It was after the use of force policy. So I think it was updated in May. We analyzed that new use of force policy. We provided the suggestions and the recommendations. 
when I say we provided recommendations, we looked at cities across the United States and said, this is the language that you could put in the policy to make it better, to make it the gold standard. So I would like to know tonight, Thank you. if you will commit to taking these recommendations and when you review and rewrite the use of force policy, putting those suggestions in there. So to be clear, I, I, uh, I'm not an expert on policing or, or use of force policies. I, I rely on uh, my team and on the uh, subject matter experts to, to guide uh, my thinking on, on such matters. Uh, the, the use of force policy that we adopted last year was uh, reflective of uh, community input as well as the direct input of Chief Buckner uh, and his team at SPD and, and Corporation Council. What we, uh, what we adopted is what we believe to be uh, the best use of force policy uh, at that time. You have since provided uh, information that uh, I do recall receiving and reviewing. Um, I can't tell you, and I'm sure you can tell me, I can't tell you what is in here that's not in our, uh, our use of force policy, but what I will commit to doing uh, just a year after, after we adopted a use of force policy is to re-review what you're proposing and to fully consider, uh, as, as I stated in my executive order, fully consider community input in addition to changes in laws. So let me just give one example. Use of chokeholds. Uh, that was something that, uh, that we adopted in our, in our use of force policy that we banned the use of chokeholds. There was a small exception for when an officer's life was in danger. The New York State recent uh, law uh, removes that, exemption, uh, that, that exception. And so uh, we need to, at, at a minimum, make sure that our use of force policy is, uh, is in line with state law. But beyond that, again, as stated in the executive order, we are fully uh, prepared to take into consideration uh, your feedback through this document and any other feedback that the community has to make it uh, a, a best-in-class policy. That is, I, I believe, our mutual goal. I, I do just want to say that you've had these recommendations for a year. What assurances can you give to us tonight that you're actually going to utilize them this time? I mean, it's been one year, yeah. right? What, what else do we have to do? We did the research. We provided them to you. We were never consulted beyond when we gave them to you. We have been here. You've known about us. We've met with you. We've done everything like Yusuf said, as we should, properly. And yet we're here having a demand that was our demand last year. And we're not gonna continue to just wait. Right? So what assurances tonight could you give us that something will happen? Can, can, in a month, is the new use of force policy gonna be done? In two months? Mayor, if I may. Please. I'm a little confused. Okay. The, Throughout writing our current use of force policy, specifically, I know that multiple times we shared information with Yousef and a couple of other people. I believe Twiggy saw some of it because she was talking about the Ferguson report throughout. Uh, Yousef certainly saw uh, the, the policy both uh, in, prog in progress and uh, the completion. Just, at, I just want to cor correct that. Yes. I didn't see the policy. Actually, our lawyers did because we sued the city of Syracuse for putting a 15-year-old on a chokehold. So when you say things like your chokehold policy changed, it isn't because the city decided affirmatively, which is how you present it to the community. You present to the community that, the, that you all have decided benevolently when actually your corporation counsel fought tooth and nail so that a 15-year-old who was placed in a chokehold by a school resource officer would not be able to do the only thing he asked. Didn't ask for a million dollars, didn't ask for a celebration. He said, I don't want anyone else to experience this. So yes, the New York Civil Liberties Union, as a part of a settlement agreement between the SPD on behalf of our client, helped to draft that policy. By so, the way, so am I, am I, so I just want to finish my sentence. The International Association of Chiefs of Police, the Police Executive Research Forum. These are not radical leftists. These are police officers. These are police executives. These are people that you all refer to as the best practices. So your policy alludes to sanctity of life, but your language doesn't actually protect 
sanctity of life. And Chief, you know this because we gave this the policy and you said to us in that meeting, what am I supposed to read this 18 page document? You said that. So if we're gonna say things, we have to be clear about what we're talking about. I don't lie. I'm not saying you lie, but I don't misrepresent to people what, we, what happened. What happened is I didn't review your policy. We had a legal team do it who conducted legal analysis and I and everyone else who was in that meeting provided that analysis two times. At St. Lucie's, I read the entire analysis. I gave it to you all. We then met a month later, and I gave it to you all. And in that policy, it tells you, because you don't have to do the work, it tells you what language you should put. It says Baltimore, and it has the language. It has San Francisco, it has the language. It has Cincinnati, and Oakland, and Raleigh, and it has the language. I just want to be clear, Chief, because if we're going to have a dialogue, we have to be transparent with the community. Agreed. Thank you. I, I, I will confirm uh, and follow up with you, but, but I want to make sure that there is no documentation of a shared back and forth between you and Mark Russell. No, we, we shared back and forth our, and in fact, when Mark asked me to review our use of force policy, I said no, because I'm not an attorney. We were in open litigation, so it's not appropriate. And then we had a discussion about the LGBTQ policy, which we did have an engagement in. So I will, the LGBTQ I will policy, that. absolutely. Yes, sir. But not the use of force policy. Okay, I will verify. Thank you. So I think Yusuf you know, covered everything that I wanted to. I mean, if there's no commitment to this demand, if it's not a yes that we're going to do this. It is a yes, to be clear. But what is the yes to? What, what, is the, what are you going to do? Because the executive order says that you will consult potentially with community groups. So, so we will, so I don't think potentially is in there. Uh, so we will review this document. We will consider the proposals in this document and we will update our use of force policy uh, after consult, con consulting this document and any other information that is shared with us. I cannot tell you right now if it's going to be 30 days or 60 days because there are other individuals that are gonna be involved in that process. What I can tell you is that uh, there's a sense of urgency here to do it and we will do it as quickly as possible and I fully expect that uh, if and when you come to the conclusion that it's not as fast uh, as, as you would like, uh, you will uh, hold us accountable to that. And uh, again, I don't feel, I don't have sufficient context to tell you a specific number of days, but it is a priority. Mayor, I just would like to say, I hope it's not another year. I'm sorry? I hope it's not another year. Okay, I, me too. I don't, don't, I don't expect it will be. There cannot be some type of hard commitment right now, but if there's not a commitment, then I think we can interpret that as a no, that the demand is not going to be met. Well, it is I'm going to be I'm going to let the next person speak okay. and you know, talk about it. Okay. Did you want to have anything else to say, Chief? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, so I want to put in context the next demand, which is about demilitarization. Um, I'm happy that the chief mentioned the way with which the community responded. Um, the challenge that we have is that when 2,000 plus people showed up at a protest, which the young people brilliantly organized and we're proud of them, which is why they're here. And we want to make you know that we see you, we hear you, we respect you, we uplift you, and we're following your leadership because you are not the future, you're the current today. And we like to talk about you in the future but you're here now, and you're doing the work now. So thank all of you for what you're doing and for your leadership. Um, in that context, we had 500 police officers, not just police officers from the police department, but jurisdictions across the region. Not just 500 police officers, but helicopters and drones and armored vehicles, and it was excessive, it was expensive, and it was absolutely unnecessary. The images of seeing boarded up shops presents the idea that we are not capable and competent to engage in peaceful discussion and dialogue. And that's the message that we're sending to our children. And so Twiggy's gonna come here today to talk about demilitarization, as well as Carol Baum. Carol's gonna go first, um, because Sarah, Carol's from the Syracuse Peace Council who has been doing this work for decades. This is the oldest, police, uh, the oldest uh, peace council in the nation. And then Twiggy's gonna connect that with the Ferguson Report and end with a personal dialogue about an experience that she's had. Carol, let me, is this a spray? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I spit a lot, so you know I'm trying to. <laughs> I think I need to bring this down a little bit. Okay. 
Hello? Yeah. Hello. Okay, I'm Carol Baum, and I work with the Syracuse Peace Council and also with Spark on this. At a public safety committee meeting the other day, Chief Faulkner said that the Syracuse Police Department is a paramilitary organization. And depending on who you are and where you live, it's also an occupying force. And we cannot have that. Either one of those cannot have it. So the militarization of the police has two primary aspects. One is the actual weaponry and equipment supporting that weaponry. And again, when we say weapon, we mean weapons that are meant for war, not for communities, but for war. And um, the other thing is the mindset, and that's how the police view their jobs and the residents they come in contact with. So the two aspects of militarization. So first, let's talk about the weapons and the equipment. There's federal programs supporting the police departments obtaining military-grade weapons and equipment. And it's either for the cost of the shipping, basically, which is the 1033 program, in which they give used military equipment. Again, this has been used in war um, and to police departments. And then there's also grant applications through the Department of Homeland Security and the Department um, of Justice Burn JAG programs. And in addition, and I can't speak to whether or not this happens here, that's part of what we'll be demanding is transparency. But in addition, there are corporate partnerships with police foundations which manage to avoid a lot of community oversight. And then there's the mindset. It has to do with who becomes a police officer, how the work is advertised, who's recruited, how they're trained, the expectations of how they behave, and the repercussions if they do not behave according to the expectations. So who might join? Police work has been called war, with all that war means. The war on drugs, the war on terror, everything is a war. It's set up mentally to be a war. You add the weapons into it, it becomes a war. It can attract people with that kind of mindset. There's the warrior cop mentality. There's soldiers going to war, which is made worse by all the military equipment that's sitting there just waiting to be played with. You know? And then there's also an army to police pipeline. In the US, one fifth of the police force is ex-military. So these are people who have been trained in military combat trying to adapt to a civilian police force. And then, of course, there's the special training, SWAT training, and other special operations. And what's developed is an industry of corporations that are out there making money off of these trainings. Many of the trainers are former military, again, reinforcing the, the warrior mindset. And I do need to say something about the drones which originated as weapons of war, and still are. And in 2013, the Syracuse Peace Council instigated a resolution in the Common Council, which was passed in December 2013. I don't know if anybody here remembers that. Resolving that, and I'm paraphrasing, I have a copy here if anybody's interested. Drones are banned from airspace over Syracuse until federal, state, and local legislation is adopted adequately protecting the privacy of the population as guaranteed by the First and Fourth Amendments, and that the use of drones by Syracuse will not commence until the appropriate personnel are trained and fully authorized by the FAA to safely operate drones, and that the Syracuse attorney certifies that all city personnel engaged in drone use have been trained in federal, state, and local <laughs> privacy laws, regulations, and enforcement mechanisms affecting drone operations and the data collected by them. So again, I have a copy I can give you before I sit down. Our demands, which I also have copies of. Transparency is a big one. I was glad to hear that there's going to be some inventory made. First, um, 
military grade equipment. Okay, since the beginning of the 1033 program through 2014, I couldn't get any data past 2014. The SBD got a total of $850,000 worth of equipment, including 25 assault rifles and a mine resistant armored vehicle or MRAP. And when you see that coming down the street, you know you're in a war zone, to be real. We as Syracuse residents need an inventory of all the military equipment you have received from these programs and any other program like this. We need figures on how much the equipment is costing us. It may be grant funded, it may be given, but there's still maintenance, there's still repairs, and there's still training. We need to know how the equipment is used and under what circumstance. The SPD needs to stop using it and give it back. It just needs to stop and needs to make a commitment to not obtain any more military grade equipment through any means that come up. So that's one set of things. Another set has to do with training and recruitment. We'd like to have a list and copies of current recruitment materials, including cyber materials and physical materials. That has a lot to do with who ends up being attracted to the job. List of where recruiters currently go and characteristics of what groups of people they focus their attentions on. Are you going after former military? Or are you going for social workers or English majors? List of companies that have been used in the last five years for specialized trainings, along with the name of the training, its cost to the SPD, and number of attendees. And then with drones, a list of how the SPD has satisfied the requirements of the resolution. List when and how drones are used by the SPD. And clearly identify them so that if a drone is buzzing overhead and you look up, you know it's from the SPD. You know, just like Yosef was saying about that rally, there were drones. And it's like, I wonder who, what they are and what they're doing and what they're going to do with that information. A lot of this is built to intimidate. A lot of the equipment is built to intimidate. The warrior mindset is built to intimidate. Drones are built to intimidate. So the question is, what are you going to do with these demands? And what's the timeline for doing them? And not only that, but if you have a timeline for the timeline, you know, because there's a lot of demands here, but we need to know that you will get back to us by a certain date with an actual timeline on these. So the question is, which of these are you going to satisfy? I'm sure you have them all memorized, but you get the picture. Yeah. And when is that going to happen? And how are you going to communicate that? So what I'll do right now is I have, I have two copies of the, three copies of the resolution. And this is the 2013 City Council <laughs> Ordinance relative to drones. Thank you. And I have one more. <clears throat> Thank you. And then I also have the demands. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, may I respond? Briefly, yeah. I, I, well, I think I think the <laughs> I think the uh, your your point about the timeline uh, or the timeline for a timeline is well taken. Obviously, that's an issue that came up on the on the last demand, uh, and and we certainly don't want the assumption to be made that uh, because we don't have a timeline, the answer is no, because that's not the case. Um, we will uh, we will endeavor to provide, uh, if if not uh, specific responses or uh, or action items, we will endeavor to provide a timeline for the uh, response or implementation of those items uh, within two weeks. Uh, within two weeks, of two tomorrow. weeks, you will provide it a, a timeline for the timeline. A timeline for the timeline. Correct. How do we feel about that? We'll give them two weeks. We'll give them two weeks. Thank you. So thank you. Um, as you can see, the uh, people's agenda for policing is incredibly important to our city, to us, to our community, 
in moving forward, and we will hold you by that, and we expect in the timeline for the timeline that there will be a beginning, middle, and end that's within our lifetimes. Understood. Even sooner than that. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Twiggy Bilyeu of the Natural Action Network needs no real introduction, but I want to provide context for what she's going to talk about today. The context is especially, and we talk about Ferguson in the language of riots. It's actually the language of uprising. And this uprising exists in the context of which uh, Carol talked about, this military cop mentality, where this deployment of armored vehicles and this deployment of tactical gear, this deployment of a occupation force, this deployment of a of a, of a civilian milita paramilitary force to engage with people who are engaged in peaceful protest. And the response of generations of extracting resources, which we don't talk about in relation to Ferguson, the extraction of resources to fund city operations, specifically targeting black and brown people by stops and by searches of vehicles and then fines and fees was how it was being done. And that is what people were uprising against. Because the fact is, it's not just about Michael Brown, though it also was about Michael Brown. It's about the fact that for decades, they were funding the city's operations off of stopping people and finding them and with suspensions. And in a place like Syracuse, where you need a car, that means in a city that has high concentration of poverty, you will continually be impoverished. And so the systematic oppression is what brought about an uprising, not a rioting, an uprising. And so Twiggy's here to talk about the work that has emerged from the Obama administration to document, to provide 21st century policing guidelines, and what the Ferguson Report talks about. Twiggy. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, you see my son and Hassan, and you also recognize Last Chance for Change, and these young folks over here, um, the Youth Cuse BLM and Raja Syracuse. Um, really, they're why we do this work, right? Um, I've told you on oftentimes that I do this work to ensure that they can begin to survive and that they can take over the leadership. But before I go into my piece, I want to know, Mayor and the police chief, how much does it tank cost to maintain a tank versus opening a city pool? I want to know how much it takes for the paramilitary training that we may have to go outside of Onondaga County or do you have people inside that do it and how much do we pay them for all of this paramilitary training? Because there's a different mindset of training when I'm using the AK-47 than my, re my officer's revolver. I also want to know how much money was spent on the riot police on May 30th that nothing really happened that, re that delegated riot reports, right? Because what I've seen in Ferguson what I see in Kentucky is what I seen here that night. It shocked me, but it shouldn't have shocked me. It shocked me with you, Chief, because you came out of this and told us you wouldn't do this anymore when you came here. We had those meetings with you all before we hired the Chief, and we came into play with certain things that we did not want, right? And things that we did want to help out with when we got a new Chief. And one of the things that we talked about is the paramilitary inventory that Carol said is growing. We haven't gotten a transparent report from the police department since 2014. New York Times is reporting that every county has more. We have now two more armored vehicles that we didn't know about. I wanna know how much it's costing our city to maintain these large pieces of vehicles that are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to maintain yearly. But we can't provide for our kids, we can't provide for swimming pools, but we can provide every and anything when it comes to the police department. A window was broken, and a window is more value to you guys sitting up there than the people sitting in the gallery. We went berserk over a window, rather than the loss of life that we've experienced and the brutality that my son and others have experienced. I'm not gonna get too much into the Ferguson report, because I've given it out for five years. Five years, when you came, Chief, we brought you to Nan. I got you on tape saying that you was gonna look at the Ferguson report, call us back, meet with us, and start to implement it. Again, as they said, we're here a year later, nothing has happened. We don't even have those community meetings anymore. I'm coming to you because it talks about focus stops. It talks about true 21st century policing. Not just saying the word, but giving the outline. Right? Law enforcement chiefs from across the country 
have supported this and we don't support it here. And we've, we're paying out, in some instances, more for a tiny city like Syracuse than some big cities are on police brutality. So how much is it really costing us to keep putting stuff underneath the ground, not being transparent about it? And you all have the Ferguson report because I just sent it to you all again, those that ask. So I didn't bring another copy. I'm dependent on you to read it. I'm not giving you 30 days or a month. I'm giving you the next two weeks because we've been asking you this for five years. One year you wasn't here. But there should not be a citizen or a group of citizens that come up with a plan that actually works that the government won't even listen to. I have to tell you that I'm hurt and I'm discouraged. I'm discouraged because the intelligence that you say that our police department has as the best around the country is flawed. It's flawed because it picked me out to be some way involved in a murder and sent detectives to my door and sent your chief to my job to call me a liar and just to find out the picture wasn't me. But I was called a liar in front of my colleagues, my staff, my coworkers. You came to my job. Police came to my house three and four times a day, even though I was sick. And nothing that I told them, they would believe. Why? Because Chief Cecil said it was so. So yes, I am discouraged. Because I clearly seen, my husband seen, how people like me can disappear on a mistake. And this is the technology that you're asking us to trust into. Facial recognition technology. I almost had this man, first I don't know what I did, then I became a witness, but had this man tell my boss, bro, if I show you the picture, you're going to take her in the back and tell her, sis, stop lying. Just to find out it wasn't me. But some still believe it was me. So if the person that works with you the best, the person that takes up for you, Chief, when the Benevolent Association is coming after you. Is it good? I don't know who is. So what I'm asking you all is when are we going to change the demeanor, starting with the chief, so it trickles down to the officers? Because the way I felt, I should have never felt that way. Not as a citizen, I didn't break the law, I was made to feel I broke the law, but now I understand what all of them talk about when they say they're getting pulled over, when you say, no, my officer was fine, and he's in your face, on you, look at my size. So if my husband comes outside, it's a problem, because he's big as the chief. We come outside, it's, a problem. it's a problem. So I'm asking you all to take note that someone like me could be confused with either being involved in a crime or being a witness that's afraid to speak up, me? <laughs> that your system is flawed, your intelligence is flawed, and you have to retake a look at it. You can no longer talk about facial recognition. We have the best technology in the country. Out of all the places I've been, Syracuse has the best, and you made that big of a mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. I think Twiggy spoke to eloquently the issues with, and this is going to go to the next demand, the problems with surveillance technologies. Deputy Mayor, as you know, um, we had a discussion in my office. Um, it was a pretty extensive discussion. Um, and Coy is going to come up in a moment, but I want to put the context in, into what Coy is talking about because Twiggy is not just talking about when a surveillance camera, and I want to, again, I want to provide context that it's not just Twiggy Bill you, it's also people with disabilities and how this operates. Because a client came to our office, and I can't disclose who the client is for privileged purposes, but an individual came to us and filed a complaint. Separately from that complaint and looking at the documents that they provided, I read the entire documentation of the allegations brought against them, and my staff looked at it, and against this individual. There was a use of surveillance camera footage and a coercion of a person with a developmental disability to say it was him. Now, I saw the footage. You cannot see that face. But they coerced him under duress to admit that it was him. The police officers in the district attorney's office prosecuted them until the charges were dropped because he was able to get an attorney who was able to get him out. 
Well, what if you can't get an attorney? And what if you can't prove your innocence? And what if we're relying on this technology? This technology that we know is so fundamentally flawed that it can't distinguish between any of the black people's faces in this room. We all look the same. Some of y'all prettier than I am. But I just want to be clear. We all look the same to this technology. Every black person, every brown person. It cannot distinguish. And it's not just the facial recognition technology. It's not just the surveillance cameras. It's also predictive policing analytics, which targets specifically communities of color, which stipulates that if you're a person that's from a certain income class, then you're more likely to have a propensity to engage in violence, which is significantly biased. And this is further problematized because of the notion that when you are politically protesting against police brutality, Technology is used to surveil and monitor you in a COINTEL 2.0 version. I'll also end with a personal narrative. It's not just surveillance technology, it's also Facebook. We know for a fact that people's communications are monitored on Facebook. And it's not just Facebook, it's LinkedIn, because your corporation counsel went onto my LinkedIn page. I got the image, I screenshot it. I meant to blow it up, but I didn't get a chance to. Why would the corporation counsel in the last week need to go on my, on my LinkedIn page. What about me does she need to investigate? How is that appropriate? And this is why I have absolutely no trust in her ability. She has abused her authority. That is completely unacceptable. We are not friends. We don't go out to dinner. We don't hang out. We're not colleagues. We barely talk to each other. For her to go on my LinkedIn page, and Mayor, I got the screenshot. For her to go on my LinkedIn page is a tactic of intimidation. And I'm not intimidated, to be clear. I fear God and that's it. And I want to be explicit about that. There is not a human being on this planet that I'm afraid of. But I will not allow anyone to do that to me ever again. And it's completely unacceptable. What happened to Twiggy was unacceptable. And these are people who are in public positions in the city of Syracuse. Imagine the amount of people that this goes to. Imagine the number of people who are completely don't have the capacity, don't have the language, don't have the protection, don't have the privilege, don't have the resources. I can take the litigation. I can put the money aside. I can pull my money together. I can finance my house and I can make it do what it do. But a lot of people can't do that. This is an example of the systemic problems with how business is done in the city of Syracuse. Coy Adams. If I may, just one point of clarification. Um, we do not use facial recognition technology in the city of Syracuse. She meant to say the surveillance camera footage. Understood. Can everybody hear me? So this is just to put context to a lot of things that Yusuf said. Thank you, Yusuf, and thank you, Twiggy. Um, the city of Syracuse has about 142, 143,000 residents, right? Good number to have for a city. Facial re recognition technology, this margin of error is about, in some cases, one one hundredth of a chance, in some cases, a thousandth or less. I'm doing the math on my phone. One one hundredth of 143,000 people is 1,430 1, people. One one thousandth of 143,000 people is 143 people. When we talk about facial recognition technology, there aren't even that many people in the room right now for that margin of error. When we talk about facial recognition technology and surveillance, your system is biased. Your system already encapsulates everybody in this room who showed up as a result of violations from the police. To make that even further complicated, to talk about what Yusuf said, how do I explain algorithm? When they were making the technology, it goes by population and percentage. Basically, they had a population pool of who had a facial recognition on their graphs. Black and brown people make up a small percentage of that, which means that they are more likely to be mistaken for one another. A lot of the people in the room came out for black lives, came out for the community. How can you say that black lives matter to your council, to everybody in the government, to everybody in the city representative, when it doesn't even matter to people in the coding? It doesn't even matter to the system. It doesn't even matter to your algorithms. And you want the community to trust you. You want the people to trust you. 
You're making assurances when one of the community leaders, I've known a Twiggy since I went to one of my first protests as a teenager for Trayvon Martin. That was eight years ago. I can't imagine getting Twiggy Bill you wrong. I really can't. I really can't. And this is what happened. If you can get a community leader along, what are you going to do to the everyday person here in Syracuse? You are making false promises to the community. I want to know, yes or no, will you review the surveillance technology that you have for Syracuse and will we be involved in that process? To be clear, we do not use facial recognition, recognition technology in the city of Syracuse. Twiggy, I love you. I, I, re I remember when this happened. There was a photo of an individual that looked like you. I know you, but it was not you. And that was ultimately the conclusion that it came to. But it was human eyes that, uh, that made that association. It was not... Rec I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not debating anything other than the fact that, that, what, that what associated you uh, was, was someone's eyes that suggested that it looked like you. It was not, I'm not saying it was right, and I'm not defending it. I, I, I understand. I just want to be clear because we, we all need to hold ourselves accountable here. That, that to, so to answer your question, there, we do not use facial recognition technology. However, uh, as I said before, we, we absolutely prioritize the protecting the people that we serve, their privacy. And Mayor we, and council, it was yes a yes or no question. What was the question? Please repeat the question. Will you commit in conjunction to the people's, to people's demands, the people's agenda, to work on the surveillance technology that you are implementing for the city of Syracuse? Yes. Will we be part of that process? If you would like to be, yes. Timeline. Timeline for a timeline in two weeks. That's, that's across the board. It's across the board. Okay. okay. We will come back. Is that okay with everyone first? Is, that, is two weeks acceptable to come back? Yeah. Understood. Understood. In two weeks, we will come back. And we'll, we will say collectively what our expectations are, and we'll determine if we met those expectations. Agree. Here we go. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, Yusuf, because I'm keeping for record, because this is going to fall on me to follow up on all of this. Can you repeat what is going to happen in two weeks? Yeah, three, three things. First, a timeline of all the demands as to when you will begin to implement the demands. Like some of them are immediate, some of them are within three months, some of them may be in a year, right? right. So that we, we want to have a broad timeline as to when all the demands will be implemented, yeah. which assumes that the demands will be in, implemented. Yeah. Second issue, specific to the surveillance technology issue, because I don't want us to get caught up on a specific technology, yeah. because then, that, then that's, that's a cop-out, and I think that we need to be fair. Yeah. You don't have facial recognition technology, granted. What technologies do you have? The, what list of technologies do you have? Right. We think and we believe that there should be a disclosure of all of the technology that the city has, mm -hmm. and that any new technology the city acquires, that there should be a citizen-driven process to ensure that there is approval of those technologies, that there's an explanation of why those, of those technologies are being used. What Coy was speaking to is the issues around a specific technology. But this isn't just, and, and I think the reason why this is important, because I, I remember one of the comments that was raised was, you know, let's, we can, we can decrease the size of the force and then we can use more technology. Mm. And that's a deep, significant concern Understood. because it still facilitates for the oppression of people. Right. And actually in a more insidious way, yeah. because the technologies are so fundamentally flawed. What Coy was talking about, and let me put my professor hat for a second because this is what I teach in the academy, is that there's a specific set of data that gets put into designing these technologies. That the people who create that, that, that technology are biased in. And so the perception is black people and brown people are more criminalized. Right. And so therefore, we have to provide more if in the sense of predictive policing or in the sense of sentencing, higher sentencing, higher rates of uh, you know, deployment of services and deployment of police officers. We have to have drones in certain neighborhoods that may not be reflective of actual real crime issues. Shot spotter is another technology. There's a, an array of technologies. And what we're saying is, 
We want to give you two weeks to be able to tell us when you're going to reveal right. all the technologies you have and where you're going to implement a plan. And we're working on legislation that we will share with the council to be able to review. Understood. It, is it, is again, that it, it, yeah. clear? That okay. Cleared it up. That is clear. Thank you. Uh, I want to move us along because we've got a, a lot of folks And I here. just want to make a comment. Absolutely. Yourself, because I'm listening to everything that's being said, okay? And, um, and I know that we talk about technology, which we do follow and pay attention. But I'm going to say a lot of it I'm not going to say is driven by technology. I'm going to say is driven by we have officers that need to be trained because it's not just about regular Joe Blow. I'm the president of Syracuse City Council, and I had an encounter with an officer a month ago. Mm. So I think it's the training, and, I, and I'm not going to say it's all officers, but some of these officers need to be trained on how to talk to people, especially people that's going to be the ones that's overseeing your budget. Yeah, I mean, if you can't respect the common council president, then you, how are you going to respect the people in the community? If you can't respect the chief of police, how are you going to respect the... And ironically, those are two black people. Go figure. Absolutely. This is why I love when Miss Anna's here, because she reminds us about that. So we're going to move forward. We're not going to address body camera. Uh, we're going to actually talk about the PBA contract. And I'm, we have actually excerpts from the union contract, the context, um, that we can, can folks bring those up. The context behind this is because we had expressed and articulated um, the demand to release it a year ago, um, and it hasn't happened, and there was reasons for it, et cetera, but there also were specific demands about what would happen in the renegotiation process. Um, I want the public to see the addendums, which are the additions to the union contract. If, if folks can come up to the front so you can see that some of this Exhibit here, crossed out lines. That's not a contract. There's no way that's an acceptable contract. But, but, but can we also be clear that that was prior to this? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm going to get okay. to that. I'm okay. going to get to that. Right. But the problem is that the extension of it mm -hmm. didn't address this issue before it was done. So it was something this in, in administration inherited, mm -hmm. absolutely. And we talked to that in our meeting. But these are the types of contexts that exist in a contract where the city is negotiating against itself where the city can't really have accountability. And I want to articulate on page, I think, 24 of the contract, which talks about the, the removal of disciplinary actions 24 months after a discipline has been done. And so Sequoia, are you here? Yeah, I see you. Hey. Um, I couldn't notice you with the mask. I'm sorry. Um, um, Sequoia is going to talk to um, some issues around the union contract and issues around accountability in the contract. Uh, and then we'll, we'll continue to move forward. Sequoia. Hello, I just was on a call with you all a couple of days ago, so it's me again. Um, I have a, whew, it's, let me bring it in. I'm wearing glasses, so if I fog up, just let it go. I wanted to be very clear about why we're here today, because I think there's a misconception that we're here because George Floyd, and with all due respect to him, that's a part of the reason. I'm here today because when I was a young kid, a cop broke my cousin's arm when she was a teenager. I'm here today because my cousin who was disabled has been brutalized by the police multiple times in this city. I'm here today because one of my cousins was brutalized by Syracuse Police Department and was missing for about 24 hours. Our family didn't know where he was at. And then we found out that he was brutalized. I'm here because my, my uncle who has heart conditions has been tased by the Syracuse Police Department. I'm here because my cousin's fiance was shot in the back on Father's Day several years ago by a Syracuse Police Department. So we can talk about what's happening nationally, but I'm here because this stuff has happened in Syracuse and it has affected me and my family. And we're also here today because of Malitra Montanez, a black woman who was sexually assaulted by a serial predator who was on the force for many years. And these things may have happened before you were here, but the city is still responsible. So, I was here, we were here about a year ago. Um, Charlotte Moore, many, many of us know what brought us here today. And I attended a meeting with along members of SPARC and we talked about this issue a year ago. In that meeting, I've expressed, Mayor, that you were elected by, let me back up. My background, public health talk about it every time I speak because I think that's a lens in which our city and everyone should be 
looking at these issues through. And public health teaches us to look at the most marginalized, look at the people who are experiencing the most worst conditions, and when you improve those conditions, you improve everybody's conditions. And so I said that in the meeting, I said that there's about 13,000 people, I think, who voted for you, many of which were black and brown communities. My Facebook was full of endorsements for you. That's were largely supported by black elders, like I said, Helen Hudson, um, Sharon Owens. Black people voted for you. Black people are also the most marginalized in this community. Black people are also, black and brown people are also the ones who are targeted by the SPD in their racist ways. Okay? And so in that meeting, I asked, did you think it was appropriate or do you think it's okay for an officer who sexually assaults a member of our community to remain on the force? Remember that question? I do. Um, I asked you, do you think it's okay for an officer who has broken a kid's arm, it was on video, and they lied about it, do you think it's okay for them to remain on force? Do you remember that? I do. Okay. And so my question today is, is what I also asked was, if you believe that these individuals who commit these acts should not be on the force, will you reflect it in the union contract? Will these be fireable offenses? Do you remember that? I believe so, yeah. So... Was that, is that reflected in the union contract that, was, that has been in um, conversation for the last year? We contend that officer discipline is not, uh, is, should not be in the union contract. Uh, that when we took the legal action to remove discipline from, uh, our, from the contract, from arbitration, which we do not believe to be in the best interest of ensuring discipline of officers, uh, we chose to take it out of the uh, out of the collecting bargaining collective bargaining process, put it into the hands of the chief of police, which would involve a public hearing process as a part of that. The same chief of police who said after Charlene Moore was brutalized that he didn't think that those cops were a threat to the community. Correct. Correct. Okay. So the reason why I'm here today again is because I'm tired of seeing my seeing my community be harmed. What I've said in that meeting, and I've said on that call we were just on, that these issues are preventable. And so, as it's stated, these are reactionary. These instances in the union contract, these policies, they do not prevent harm. I'm sorry, but I don't believe that he will be able to hold his cops accountable. Because he said, after we all watched the video of Sean Moore get dragged out of his car, that he didn't think it was a threat to the community. But it was. It's historically been a threat to the community. Violent, Violon Smith, or whatever his name is, is, still, is he still on the force? Violon Smith, is he still an officer? Can anyone say that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Again, this speaks to, you had us, you, I think it was in December, um, the, the council decided to withdraw the motion to vote on the union contract. And you said that, um, you were great that they open, continue to dialogue because you want a strong police force in a, member, in a community um, relationship. But what I'm telling you today, in my opinion, which I believe is accurately assessing what I've seen and experienced, is that you cannot have positive relationships with the police in the community if you do not reflect that in your policy and the things that you sign into law or whoever signs into law. So the fact that there is nothing that, that states, to my knowledge, that a cop can sexually assault me and he could keep his job, but I'm supposed to look at that same force who, who is employing him and say, that's a strong police department. Somebody can beat my cousin who is disabled, who cannot, he cannot move as fast as a person who's able-bodied. A cop can beat my cousin after it's been confirmed that he's disabled and still stay on the force. How does that tell me that this is a strong police department? Oh, it's strong, right? They can strongly get away with everything they want to do. You cannot, it, 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 it is contradicting yourself to say that you want these things and, that, and you say you, you care about the black community, you care about the people who voted for you. I do. And it not be reflected in the actions that we have. Last year it was a request. This year it's a demand. Because I believe you're running for re-election next year, correct? Correct. I want an, I, if I am going to vote or tell people to vote and be civically engaged, what actions 
reflected by what your, you and your office is advocating for in the police union tells me Sequoia is going to be safe. That she knows that if she's sexually assaulted, if she's brutalized, if her cousin gets an arm broken, that the police is going to be fired. Because there needs to be a zero tolerance policy on these things. And I, I hear Helen when she says that there needs to be more training. But the studies have been done. Bias, by implicit bias training does not stop police brutality. I think it, we, that makes it seem like these cops don't know what they're doing, and they do. It's reflected in the data. That it's reflected in the data. And that's why I said on the call, we gotta do some evidence-based research. Because when you say one thing, but the data doesn't line up, I'm not gonna have faith in that. Sequoia, that's why it's so important to me that we get police officers from our community that lives in our community. See, I hear that, but I think it was Ahmad Sims who was a black officer from Syracuse who was involved in an incident. It's Valon Smith, a black officer who went across the street to attack a peace activist. So for me, it's more than just having people from our community, because if our people in our community don't respect us, then it's just gonna be the same issue. It's a systemic issue. It's honestly not about race, it's about policing as a whole. It needs to be changed. And so I wanna know what commitment you're going to make to make sure that cops who sexually assault people in my community do not continue to serve on the force. Cops who break the arms of students, because I was there two years ago at the, at the Board of Education meeting, where we, community members, hundreds of us, demanded that SROs get out of our schools, and y'all re-signed a contract with them. After Jabari Bokens had his arm broken, I'm sick of it. My brother, my nephews, my nieces, they go to these schools. Their experiences are not negotiable. The, the students have said what they wanted. They want the cops out of the schools. Our lives are not negotiable. And so, again, I will continue. These things, I know all we have to figure out was safety. Who is deciding what is safe? Who is deciding what security looks like? Because if it's gonna be replaced with the same people with the same mentality, then that our kids will not be safe. <sighs> I'm, I'm not even sorry. So I'll repeat again, because people could say, I know this situation with Jabari, we've asked, we've been calling for Valon Smith to be fired since he broke Jabari's arm. And the chief has said, well, I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't the chief at that time. And that's fine. But it's the conditions within the force that allow people to feel like they can treat us like this and get away with it. So you might not have been here when Valon Smith did that, or you might not have been responsible for the police chief, but you have a, a responsibility to change the conditions that allow cops like Valon Smith to remain on the force. That's your responsibility. It's no more sh shift in the book. All of you, we have put it on notice that it's time and time again, and I don't, this is my, I moved here f four years ago and I'm here another summer yelling in a chamber where last year I, my elected officials walked out on me when I was here speaking to them. That's how I was treated, but we want youth to be involved. I'm a youth and my elected officials walked out on me so I'm done. I didn't want to come to the meeting last year, but come on, Sequoia, we gotta, we gotta tell them what we want. I'm done. My work speaks for itself. It is time for you all to implement what we say, because we are the experts in this. Our community knows what we want, we know what we need, and we need it reflected in the works, in the paperwork, in the contract that we don't want. If you, can, you cannot assault me, and stay on the force. You cannot break my son's arm and stay on the force. You cannot call me nigger and stay on the force.
I don't think I can add any that, anything other than what she said to provide context because superintendent, I gotta correct the record. I've got an impeccable memory and I, I keep it pretty clear here. You all didn't decide, again, benevolently to remove Valen Smith from schools. We showed up. We took over that school board meeting that wasn't about this issue. We, as a community, demanded it. We met with you in your office and we met with the mayor in his office. And then you all decided that. And so I, I just, I think we give the people the impression that you all are affirmatively doing that. And then you went on the press after that meeting and we can go back to the record and we can look at it and then said, no, 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 we don't want to remove all after we all agreed in that meeting. And that's why we are demanding a people's agenda because we don't want reform. Reform, as I've said multiple times, barring the analogy that Malcolm X made, is taking a nine inch blade out on our back and pulling it six inches and expecting I'm gonna be fine. We don't want the knife in our back. We want it out and we don't just want it out. We want to be healed and repaired from the harm. So we're gonna now move on to what defunding policing is about. Because what we've all demonstrated is a body of evidence that supports the way with which the institutions in the city of Syracuse operate are fundamentally problematic, that the institution of policing as we know it is not going to be able to reform itself. You cannot, express, you cannot expect slave owners to reform slavery. Like who's gonna do that? You can't expect police to reform policing. And to think that that's gonna happen is an effort of futility. And so we took a look at the budget the proposed fiscal year 2021 budget, and we see there's about $253 million proposed. Is that correct? Yeah. Of the $253 million, 49.4 million are going towards policing. Correct? Correct. That doesn't include litigation, right? It correct. doesn't. Correct. Correct. Um, it doesn't include the millions of dollars in lawsuits for a city that's on the verge of fiscal collapse that we paid out. Right. That doesn't include the fact that police officers tasered 15-year-olds, a man in a wheelchair, and that's what caused the taser policy to change, not the city affirmatively doing that. It doesn't address the fact that the chokehold policy changed because of litigation and I'm being sued. These are never going to be policies that are going to be changed because the city decides it should be changed, which is why we are demanding that it's done. And so of the, 50, of the, of the 253 million, 49.4 million goes to policing. 8.5 million and 4.4 million. And I want, I think it's important for people to see this pictorially so you can see what we're saying is more valuable. Budgets are moral documents. Now, you and I are both alumnus of the Maxwell School of Public Administration, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. We took that public budgeting class, right. correct? correct? It was pretty boring. I didn't like it. Nor did I. But, you know, we had to take it, correct? And you learn about budgeting. And budgeting is a moral document. What budgeting says is, what are your priorities? What do you value more? We value policing more than we value parks, recreation, and youth programs. We value policing more than we value neighborhood and business development in a city that has the highest concentration of poverty amongst blacks and Latinos in the whole country. So when we talk about defunding police, what we're saying is Mr. Watkins, who was killed by a police officer, who responded for his disability, an elderly man who isn't a real threat, a real risk, whose life is no longer here, police shouldn't have been called to that in the first place. They shouldn't be responding to those incidents. As you said, Chief, about discipline. Police are not to be in schools to discipline. That's not, they're not mental health therapists. What we're saying is the reallocation of resources in our city towards things that we know, as Sequoia said, are best practices. What we're saying, and Nikita is going to come up here and talk to this as eloquently as she can and probably more clearly and powerfully than I'm going to be able to, what the philosophical understanding is behind reinvesting and reallocating resources towards what we know works. It does not work to police and target communities. And I just want to give two reflections. On Sunday, someone who I'm really close to, someone who is a brother of mine, um, excuse me for a moment, someone that everyone, t everyone said wouldn't amount to anything, someone who lived in a refugee camp and immigrated to this country, 
I'm literally only in Syracuse because of this family. That is why I'm in Syracuse. This young man was shot on Sunday. And praise God, and I'm a spiritual person, so I'm going to do that, that the person who found him was a doctor. That is grace. That is divine. But not for that, this individual might not be here today. I understand because my brother was shot dead in front of my apartment building. As a five-year-old, I had to watch my mother every day tell me, you can't play with guns. You can't have a toy gun. You can't go out and this. I get it. I grew up in the Bronx at the height of gang violence. We think we have gang violence in Syracuse. The Bronx was a war zone. As I talk about and I've talked about before, there's this perception that because of my addiction that I've had a silver spoon in my mouth. I'm the youngest of eight kids and grew up in a family with 20 in the same four-bedroom apartment in the South Bronx when there was real struggle. And I'm not trying to de- uh, reduce the struggle in Syracuse. I get gang violence. But policing wasn't the solution to that. So policing is not the solution to poverty. Policing is a reactionary response. Surveillance cameras don't stop people from committing crimes. They barely even find them if they do it. <laughs> what we're talking about is what are the best practices to express why is there that much rage in a person that they want to inflict harm on someone else? What about what is happening around them facilitates for that to be their only ability to respond? You're not going to get that by locking them up. You're not going to get that by deploying tanks and armored vehicles. I'm on a soapbox. I'm going to stop. I'm going to let Nikita come up and speak. Thank you. Well, uh, a lot of folks have already covered um, the stuff that I want to talk about, but I do feel like when we start talking about defunding the police, it's important for us to understand that it's not just about it's not just about a money issue, although it is, but it's also about reducing the power of the police. Because what we've seen here. Um, and what we've heard from here, what we've heard here is that you all have unchecked power to do whatever it is that you want to do, right? And then it's also about the size. I mean, this budget, like Yusuf just said, is a moral document. I mean, there's no clearer example of where our priorities are in the city. And it's also about reducing the scope um, of the police here in the city. And it's like, I've been, I'm a part of BLM, and the issue around police brutality is so... Uh, it's so critical and it's so crucial and we've been supporting and working with families and just the level of devastation and trauma that the SPD has meted out to people, specifically black people in this, country, in this city, is barbaric and unjust and for that reason alone, the, the department should be defunded. And then, and then, like other folks have said, I've, I've been going through the document, I've been going through the last year's budget. And I saw this pro- program, Syracuse Opportunity Works. It's supposed to be a community, a city-based program for job employment for young people in the city, ages 16 to 24. I want y'all to guess what y'all, how much money y'all think that program is allocated. 300,000, lower. 30,000, it was $74,700. Meanwhile, you got, you, y'all are giving 49 and a half million, and that does not include the five million dollars in compensation that people rightfully deserve from being brutalized by officers on your force. Chester Thompson, like Sequoia talked about, a serial rapist. I imagine Chester Thompson still collects his pension. And it's important to note that Chester Thompson wasn't fired for rape. He was fired for, quote unquote, having sex on the job. How on earth can somebody who's armed with a weapon, who's, who's the ultimate symbol of power in our city and in our society, how on earth can that person consensually have sex with somebody on the job and still collect a pension? I bet his pension is more than what y'all give these young people in the Syracuse Opportunity Works. And to use your own words, you've been using this word reimagine. And it's imagine what young people, young black and brown people, how they could develop and realize their potential if there was a line item budget for 10 million, 20 million, 30 million for what it is for them to develop who they need to be and who they are. We got young people all in this room, 
All these kids deserve $20 million. Like I said, I've been doing my homework. I've been looking in the budget. 9% of the, only 9% of the funds allocated to SPD go to criminal investigations. So everybody says, oh, they stop crime, they stop crime. It don't seem that important to y'all because only 9% of, of y'all's resources are allocated to that. So that tells me to use your language and the language from the movement, this is a prime opportunity for us to reimagine and, re, and reinvest where those funds go. Think about this issue with the fireworks. The fireworks are getting on everybody's nerves. That's fine. But imagine, and because this is the thing that gets on my nerves about community policing. We don't need to have community policing. There are people, like Sequoia said, people in the community are already experts. People in the community already have relationships. What if we invested in a program of community intervention workers, where people who already have relationships to people in the community to say, you know what, bro? You gotta stop popping them fireworks off. And because they have respect, because they have rapport with people in the community, see, you don't need to be arrested. It's a shame that people are going to have misdemeanors on a record. And we're talking about black and brown people who are already poor. So now you're going to have something on your record around fireworks. That don't make no sense. Get that money out of the SPD and invest millions upon millions of dollars in community-led, community-based programs and initiatives. I'm going to give an example from Minneapolis. There was, a, there was a guy, Farone Brown, he was, in, he was involved in a gang. And so he started this program. I can't remember the program off the top of my head. He started this program. They only gave him about $150,000. And in just a six month time, the amount of shootings that happened in Minneapolis dramatically reduced because he went out because he had relationships to young people in that city, had meaningful relationships with people. They respected him and taught them conflict resolution. So it's not about trying to train the police to have, to have better, relationships with, better relationships with us and to us. We already got people in the community who have relationships to people. Invest that money in them so they can be the ones actually cultivating communities. Because the problem is that we have, and the problem is that because we are in a city that is broke, the answer that this city has decided is that poor black people, working class black people deserve policing and not jobs, not investment, not programs. And so to use your language, Mayor, this is a prime opportunity for you. This is an invitation for you to rise to the occasion and actually concretely implement you know, this, this reimagining. And it's not about, and we can't do the thing where we normally do, where we have a task force and the community has quote unquote input. No, this is a prime time for, for, for participatory budgeting. Communities need to be the ones deciding, this is where I need $10 million to go. This is where I need $20 million to go. Now it's not, again, it's not about no input, not about a recommendation. They need to have, they are the experts on the ground. They know what their communities need. They know what their families, they know what the person next door to them needs. Let them be the ones to decide what happens. So will you commit to implementing a participatory budgeting to dramatically shift resources from SPD, and it's not on no 1%, no 5%, it's got to be dramatic. It's not a rhetorical question, Ben. It's just waiting respectfully for you to be done, which I understand you are now. Uh, as far as participatory budgeting goes, we have, uh, we have been working as an administration on beginning to implement a, particip a participatory budgeting process. Uh, and it is our goal by our next budget, uh, which will be passed in May of 2021, uh, that we have a component of participatory budgeting uh, within that process. Uh, as it relates to, uh, to dramatically reducing the funding of the Syracuse Police Department, the funding associated with the Syracuse Police Department is based on what they currently do. So I believe that that level of funding that we have in there is, is appropriate for what we are currently asking our police officers to do. As I included in the executive order, it is now the op we have an opportunity, and I agree that it's an opportunity. And to be fair, reimagining, I think I stole that from Governor Cuomo, but the, but we think that there's that an came from the movement, FYI. It came before long before Cuomo. Just, just so as we'll credit the movement um, that uh, that we we do intend to to undertake that process this year. And as we undertake that process, if we do in fact identify, and I I expect that we will. It is my intent that we will identify. Uh, areas where the Syracuse Police Department uh, 
is not the best place to be performing those duties and we are able to reassign those duties somewhere else, then I think it's reasonable to expect and I intend to reallocate resources uh, away from the police department to support that work being done by some other entity. And I want to ask you, do y'all have, is there a line item uh, delineation or is, do you all have a sense of how much time your officers spend doing X, Y, and Z activities in, in the community? Because like I said, when I looked at the budget, only 9% was going to criminal investigations and a whopping 46% was going to, it said responding to um, emergencies and services. That's a very broad range and that doesn't, and that's the kind of stuff that can be outsourced or given to the experts on the ground. And so it's like, again, that's a very broad category. 46% of the, of the funding for your budget goes to responding to emergencies and other services. What are those emergencies and what are those other services? So it, as, as it is with every budget that I've ever been associated with, 85 to 90% uh, of the budget is usually salaries and benefits. Uh, in our profession, uh, that, that is negotiated. Uh, through collective bargaining. The 10% that you speak of are for operating expenses uh, and why you see police chiefs, mayors, other appointing authorities when we get to talking about the budget, uh, the thing that moves the, the, the train down the rails, you're not talking about a lot of money. So when we talk about defunding something or removing something uh, from an operational sense and a, a significant uh, takeaway from that, everything has consequences uh, to that. Uh, I certainly agree with you that there are many things, uh, or at least several, that we've been asked to do that I do not believe the police should be the first responder for that. Mental illness, homelessness, um, behavioral in, uh, incidents uh, in, in our school system. Those are things that other professionals should be the front line for that, uh, and we are very much so interested in someone taking over the primary responsibilities for that. I, I'm, I'm gonna sit down and shut up in one second, but I also think that I, I think that that is that's because the movement nationally has pushed that's on people's radar, and, I, and that's I think that's important. But I also think there has to be a real uh, consideration around these quality of life crimes, quote unquote crimes. Again, like selling drugs because you don't have no money because if you're in a city that's broken, you can't get a good job. That person needs to be uh, sent to a job program. Again, these fireworks, all this stuff. These quality of life crimes, I saw in the report, it was like 2,000, uh, there was, last year it was like 2,000 uh, arrests or charges made for that. Whereas in the report, and on the budget that I saw, it was only 601 people were arrested for felonies. So it's not even like the quote unquote serious crimes that are like driving people to be like criminalized. It's these small misdemeanors. So that's why the, the funds need to be redirected from that to people in the community, again, who have relationships and can be, pr provide meaningful support. It's not just the mental health stuff, it, the, although that stuff is critical in homelessness, but stop criminalizing poverty, because that's, that's essentially, stop getting paid to criminalize poverty. That's the problem. So are you all willing to take money from, again, th this uh, ridiculous, incessant criminalization and targeting of poor black and brown folks in the city and invest it to those same people so they can have meaningful jobs and alleviate so many of the problems that we have in our community that are rooted in exploitation and poverty. Are you willing to take those funds from the police and, and invest them into the community around these misdemeanors and quality of life crimes? Again, I think I, I, think I stated that it's my intent to, as we identify those areas where the police department shouldn't be uh, the, the first responder, uh, and, and we implement that in practice, uh, the, any resources that are associated with that can, that can and should be directed will be. That's, my, my answer remains the same there, but that, that is certainly the intent. And the last thing is it can't just be you all doing the considering of what needs to be taken out. Again, it needs to be the community because they're the one who feels the neck in the boot of the SPD. Understood and agreed. And just to add some context, you know, and I know we're, we're you know, going over time, but it's all right. We started late, so we're going to keep it going. Um, how, what percent of the police live in the city? Uh, what, about five percent or so. Five percent, so 95% don't live in the city. Yes. So when you say that the vast majority of the percentage goes towards salaries, et cetera, yes, fringe benefits, that means that they take their money on 81, go to outside the city, pay taxes 
in those communities that have some of the best schools while we have an underfunded school district. $60 million up. So I just want to put into context what we're talking about because it's really easy to say, Mayor, and with all due respect, I like you, but that was a very politician answer. What, I'm it's, sorry, what specifically? The, the, we will consider and we will look. What, I'm, what, I'm, what we're saying is we're not interested in considering and looking. What we're saying is actually there's $50 million, commit to $20 million cut. Right. Because we're sending money as the mayor of Syracuse. When you don't have a tax base, you're sending money out of Syracuse. And not just for 30 years, for the rest of their life. Because their pensions, their health insurance, their family. So we are funding for other people's communities to have the promise of the American dream while we are denying it in our community. That's the context that you as the mayor have to look at this under. So when we talk about renegotiating union contract, what we're saying is you can't play around with maybe um, we will, no, y'all gotta go because you don't provide a service that is beneficial to the community, that is meaningful to the community. The services that you provide criminalize our community, impoverish our community, reallocate resources to suburbs. We are actually funding the suburbs, both in our police department, and in our schools. And to be clear, just to be clear, it's not just the fact of like the percentage of people, we're also funding what race of people on the police force. The percentage of race of teachers as well, superintendent, board president. So we wanna put in context because it's not just a class issue, it's a race issue. We're telling black and brown people and poor people, you don't matter. The, de the devil's in the data and in the details. Mayor, respectfully, it is not acceptable for us to be here considering. We gotta be bold. You said you were gonna rise above, that's your campaign slogan. Yes, we have to rise, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll be done in a second. We have to rise to that level. Right. We have to say we can't accept a system that allows for police officers and payouts of a union contract. By the way, we listened to Jeff Piedmont and the teachers union above the people who live here. Jeff Piedmont is deplorable. Yeah, I called you out, Jeff. I'm totally okay with it. Because that commentary is demeaning and disrespectful. And it has no place in civil society. The way that they spoke about the chief as a black man. You're overweight. You're this. That's deplorable. If they don't respect the chief who's the head of the department, how are they going to respect us? If they don't respect the common council president, how are they going to respect us? So we're not asking, again, I want us to reframe the narrative and the conversation we're having. We're not begging. We're not here to say please. We're saying we expect you to do it. And not in a year, in May 2021. Did the council approve the budget yet? Yes. She just shook her head no. Which budget? The, the fiscal 2021 budget. Yes. Okay. And is there any clause that precludes you from being able to reallocate resources? No, there's not. There's nothing. There's nothing because if you, there's nothing that precludes you from being able. I'm asking. It's a, it's a fair question. No, so I, the 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 reality is that I mean there is a there is a process. For, I know. I'm asking. Is there anything the that budget. precludes you from doing it? I don't yeah. want to know that there's a process. We we assume there's a process. Is there anything that precludes you from being able to reconsider the funding as articulated in the budget? Not. No. No. There's not. So we should, in two weeks, be able to get an understanding of the timeline whereby you all are going to begin to think about how we're reallocating resources. That's not a request. And you all can decide you're not going to do it. Right. And then we will figure out what we're going to do moving forward. What we're saying is that's what we're demanding. So we're not requesting. We're not imploring. We're not you know, requiring. We're not interested in a dialogue about what we're saying is that $50 million towards suppressing, as Carol Baum said, um, targeting communities, by occupying forces. This is not Palestine. Palestinians shouldn't ex experience that, which is why there's solidarity between Black Lives Matter activists and Palestinian activists, because we both understand what being occupied forces looks like. When you talk about a ghetto, the language of ghetto comes from World War II, where Nazi Germany exterminated people. And it wasn't just exterminated in killing them, it was exterminating them in applying resource extraction, in denying them job opportunities, and then it led to their extermination. So we have to be clear in understanding that the institution, and I don't want to talk about police officers because it's really easy to do that. The institution evolves out of white supremacy. 
It exists out of the concept of ensuring that slaves would be maintained. It then evolved to facilitating the maintenance of Jim Crow. It then evolved to maintaining mass incarceration. So when we talk about why we have a graduation rate to make this full circle, why we have a graduation rate below 50% is because we suspended people disproportionately. What job you getting in the 21st century without a high school diploma? You ain't getting the job, so what are you supposed to do? This is the concept that you have to begin to reimagine there. That's what we're asking of you. And actually, that's what we're demanding. Because it's no longer going to be accepted that this is the way with which our community will operate. Business as usual is over. We are demanding a people's agenda. And we're here to say the agenda is happening now, not in six months, not in a year. And we will mobilize people to infect change in this community because that is what's necessary. We are only having this discussion because people mobilized. And we've got to make sure to the people that are mobilizing, you keep mobilizing. We got to keep mobilizing because that's the only way in the United States that anything has changed. It was never about people in power. As I posted, never ask people in power to determine the timeline of your liberation because they will always delay and obfuscate. And the body of evidence has been demonstrated. Again, this is not a personal issue. This is about what is about the leadership role that you told that you were going to take as the chief executive of the city of Syracuse. The buck stops with you, Mayor. It doesn't stop with just the chief. And I know you look a little mad, but it's okay. It don't stop with the deputy mayor. It don't, it's all of us are complicit in this. And you are either part of the solution or you are facilitating for the maintenance of the problem. I have George who's going to talk about, and you can respond in any way you want, who's going to talk about some of the issues around defunding and why it's necessary. Thank you. My name is George Kunkel. Uh, I work at the Center for Community Alternatives. So I'm really happy that Nikita and Yusuf were hitting on the issue of defunding the police because we need to talk about what the police actually do with day to day on their shifts. So the New York Times released some data on, that was open data from other departments around the nation. It came up with the fact that in 10 different departments, only 1% of the calls that police respond to are for violent crimes. That equates to 4% of the time that they spend on shifts responding to the things that we think police are doing all the time, the things that we think justify military force and occupying force in our cities. If you look at this, if you look at this one, you can, hopefully you can see it. They spend 35 to 40% of their time responding to non-criminal calls. Why the hell are we paying police officers $8 million in overtime a year when they are responding 40% of their time on shift to non-criminal matters? Makes absolutely no sense. And Chief, you keep putting out this argument that you know, so much of the budget for the police department is caught up in salary. Well, $8 million of that is caught up in overtime why aren't we cutting that $8 million in overtime? I don't understand it. And there's a pattern in Syracuse, too, because every year for the past four years, the council has allocated, you know, about $6.5 million for overtime. That's ridiculous. But every year, the police office, despite the fact that they're budgeted for six point five, they spend eight, more than $8 million. That's a cut right there. What are we, what are we doing? Um, so when we talk about redistribution, we're not only talking about taking money away, right? I think Nikita did a great job of talking about how we're talking about reinvestment in the community. Yusuf hit, hit the nail on the head as well. But we also have to talk about alternatives to policing. And so, Mayor, I want to talk about your executive order. At the top, you talked in four, point number 15 of your executive order, you're going to, quote, research and consider non-police emergency responses. Nah, we're, we're done with research and consideration. Your research is going to be a task force full of police officers who are going to take a year to decide and then consider that they're not going to do something. And the fact of the matter is, at, at the Center for Community Alternatives, I work, I work with people who are over-policed, over-arrested, and caught up in the system because they have a mental health diagnosis, they deal with addiction, or they deal with homelessness. They're caught up in the system because of those issues, and they're undertreated because of those issues. Now, when you have somebody who's not, not in treatment for their mental health illness, we know that they're 16 times more likely to be killed by police officers. That's important to know because police officers are a danger to the community. 
And too often we get people like Jeff Piedmont talking about our citizens as a danger to community. But we're talking about replacing the police because they are the ones who have the guns. They are the ones who have the weapons. So across the country, programs in different cities are dealing with this problem by responding with a medic and a mental health professional, not a police officer, to every single mental health call that comes into 911. They're doing that because police officers are ill-equipped and untrained to deal with mental health crises. I'll tell you about one program in Eugene, Oregon. It's called Cahoots. It's being replicated across the country. Real easy to call them up and ask how you can do it here. You know why it's being replicated? Because last year they responded to 20% of the city's total 911 calls, and they did it on a budget of $2 million. Compare that to the $49 million we spend on the police. That is ridiculous. What's the so, name of the program again? Can you repeat it, please? Cahoots. It's in Eugene, Oregon. Just Google, literally, non-police emergency response. I can't believe you didn't know it before you put out an executive order on it. This, this is, we're done with research and consideration. It's time for allocating funds and implementation, Mayor Walsh, okay? And I want, to, I want to be clear that we're not just talking about non-police emergency response. We're talking about investment in community like Nikita and Yusuf has said. New York City just cut a billion dollars from the NYPD. A billion dollars. We're talking about dramatic cuts. And that money is going to youth programming, education, and the housing authority. The state of public housing in Syracuse is abysmal and we're spending $49 million on the police. What are, we, what are we doing to redistribute funding? So Mayor Walsh, with all that being said, my question for you is this. In, in this two-week timeline that you've laid out, are you going to provide very specific amounts of money that you are going to take to drastically reduce the SPD budget? Are you going to provide specific programs that that money is going to? And are you, are you going to provide a specific timeline for how we're implementing all of this process? Because as you have pointed out, there's nothing stopping you from making amendments to the budget. You just said it right here. So we need to know right now. I'll, re I'll repeat that in two weeks, I'm going to lay out a time frame in which I'm going to do the things that you just asked me I'm going to do. I'd like you to say it, actually. You're going to drastically reduce the SPD budget and reallocate that funding to community programming, the human services, and alternatives to policing. That, that's, then I'm glad you asked me to clarify, because that's not what I'm saying. That's not what you're saying. That's Why aren't you saying, saying that? Be, be, and, and this goes back to, to Yusuf, your point about what you, just, what you characterized as a politician's answer. I... I'm very careful about what I say because I want to be, I want to, I expect to be held at my word. And so can I, you're asking if I can commit to, uh, to a specific uh, amount of money or to a dra dramatic reduction in, in funding when, when we haven't developed a plan for how that would work. So I can't do that. I'm committing to, to researching and forgive me for not knowing about cahoots. I do now, so thank you for that. Researching those models with, and if, if we're going to look at the executive order, with a goal of shifting the paradigm from primary police response to response by non-police professionals in relevant fields. That's what I've committed to. Mayor Walsh, I'm not hearing a yes or no answer to the fact that you're going to drastically reduce I the SPD budget. Right. And that is a politician's answer. Okay. And the reason that we're here pushing all of these things is because we need a people's agenda, okay. because you've shown time and time again, whether it's the use of force policy or the right to know act, that when you don't say you're going to do something, it doesn't happen. Okay. This is how accountability works, Mayor, and you need to make commitments here today. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more person to talk about the defunding issue, and I think the reason why this person is going to come up is twofold. First, it's important for us to understand that when we talk about safety, the perspective that we have is safe for whom, from whom, okay? Because oftentimes safety is about protecting white people from black people. Now, I live in Strathmore. You live in Strathmore. I think I'm the only non-white person and my wife for like 50 houses. And I can tell you in the Strathmore page, I had to screenshot the number of comments that were made about you worship a pedophile, rapist, safe owner. I'm like, who are you talking about? I'm not, I'm not a Trump supporter. But that's what people said to me as a Muslim. Okay, as a black man, the comments and the visceral way with which people look at you as they walk by you. There's a research paper that's come out about the generational trauma that we literally pass genetically to our children. 
Okay? Literally, we pass into their DNA trauma. Not just from slavery, not just from George Floyd and Amadou Diallo and Breonna Taylor and Trayvon Martin, and I can continue, unfortunately, to name so many people. It's about being stopped in a grocery store. It's about you don't live in this house. It's about why you on the street. It's about why you driving this BMW. It's about who do you think you are. It's about you're not an adequate person to speak on this issue. It's about how dare you, this is the reverse of racism, which is not a thing, by the way. It's about this is black on black crime, which is not a thing, by the way. There's no such thing as black on black crime. It just doesn't exist. There is crime that exists in communities because we live in hyper-segregated communities. And because we live in hyper-segregated communities, you're more likely to inflict violence upon those with whom you know. So white people statistically engage in violent acts against white people the very same rates that black people engage in violence and Latino people, indigenous people, etc. Because we live in segregated communities. But somehow, when it happens in a white community, God forbid he had a trouble life. He needed therapy. When it's in a black community, look at those thugs, those gangsters, those derelicts. And that exists in our neighborhood. And I would love for you to be able to challenge the people in our neighborhood mayor to rise up to those issues. But we also hear the issues around domestic violence brought up. Which, by the way, if you've never seen the movie, which is one of the most classic movies, the actual first motion picture that we know of called A Birth of a Nation. Yes which revolutionized the music, the, 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 the movie industry yes, and the motion reel was revolutionized because of this movie. And that movie was about protecting white men, white women from the fear, the unreal fear of black men and how that's integrated in not just motion picture or public culture, but also in policy and practice. And so when you deal with issues around domestic violence, there's this conversation about well, women who, engage, who, who are victims of, of, of domestic violence and sexual assault need police. I think someone's going to come up here and talk about what that means to them as a survivor. Marissa. So all of you know me or know of me or have been in the same rooms. Um, I'm not coming here before you with any hats other than a community member and a survivor. I'm gonna try to do this. So a year ago, I was sexually assaulted here in Syracuse. And there were a lot of things that um, ran through my mind, but I will be honest, it was never to call the police. Not ever. I eventually decided not to call the police and not to get the police involved. And there were a couple of factors, but I wanna to talk to you today about the main, one of the uh, main issues and factors as to why I did not call the police. What I have seen the 10 years that I've been living here in Syracuse is that the police department and the police officers are ill-equipped to deal with highly emotionally charged situations in conflict. And I knew that I was emotionally charged. I knew that they were not going to be able to talk to me with the level of kindness, respect, assurance, and comfort that I knew I was going to need. And because I was highly emotional, I also realized that highly emotional individuals react and respond differently. And because of that, a lot of black and brown bodies have been killed. I thought about the woman who was killed in her home. I thought about the woman that had killed, been beat down in the streets. I thought about every single time I've been pulled over and my children have been pulled over. But more than anything, I thought about how I had just been violated. And I could not go to any of you to talk to you about anything. And I could not call the place that we're spending $49 million to help me feel safe in my own damn community. So forgive me if I'm not on the reimagined bandwagon. I'm on the we need to change this mess. I'm in the we need to transform this mess because I have to now walk a year later still not feeling safe. 
Still, I still don't walk by myself anywhere. Rarely, you will not see me out and about like that ever again in this city until we change it, not reimagine it. Reimagine what I already know what it's supposed to look like. The community already knows what it's supposed to look like. So we don't need to reimagine anything. We just need to freaking change it. I need you to look at me and tell me to my face that you are not going to do it. Tell me that. Because that's all I keep hearing. That's all I keep hearing. And personally, those of you who have sat at tables with me, what you do know is that I don't talk much. I'm a doer. You don't see me up in these mics. You don't see me doing, you don't see that very often from me. But that's how important tonight was for me. Not everyone knows my story. Not everyone knows that I went through this. Not everyone knows, but I'm here. This is how important it is that I'm sharing it live. That's how it hurts, and I'm still healing. But I had to go to my community to get the love, the comfort, the understanding, and the release from the guilt and the shame that I was feeling because I knew if I went to the cops, that's mostly what was gonna happen anyway. And what's even sadder is that it wouldn't matter the gender of the police officer because we've seen female officers and they're still on the force after shooting people in the back, after this, after that. So it wouldn't have mattered to me who showed up for me. I knew they were not going to be equipped. So please, <laughs> forgive me if I don't want to hear about your damn timelines. Forgive me for not wanting to hear that. I need you to know I'm watching you. And I remember telling you that, Mayor Wash, before you was elected, when you came to a coffee with the candidates and you and Sharon were standing there, sitting there, and I said to you, I'm going to be watching you. And what did you say to me? I want you to. I've been watching you. And I did not call your police department. I did not call your police department. And I need you to feel that. I need you to hear that. And I need you to respond to that in something other than just talking to me. Because you talking to me did not save me. It did not help me. It did not heal me. It still has not healed me. So your talk, I don't want to hear it anymore. I want to know that you are going to change, transform. Because transformation is radical. It's uncomfortable. It's discomfort. But it makes a, 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 an impact. I am tired of the ineffectiveness in this city. I'm tired of it because everyone talks. I want us to move beyond conversation. I want to move beyond conversation. I expect follow up and follow through. I expect a level of excellence from all of you because I voted for you. I voted for you. I voted for you. I voted for you and you let me down. I brought others to vote and you let me down. I need you to hear that. I voted for you and you let me down. And personally, I'm done allowing you to let me down. You either are gonna help me or you gonna get the hell out of the way so we can get some people in here that are actually gonna do something because I'm tired and I've only been here 10 years in this fight. I can't imagine everyone else that's been here. And let's be clear, you all know me enough to know that I'm an advocate in this community. I'm just not one that's out in the front. I do all my stuff behind the scenes, but you all know that though about me. So if I, me, if I didn't have it in me to come to you can you imagine who else is in the community bearing this? Can you imagine them bearing this? I have to walk with this every single day. Can you imagine the hundreds of others of me? There are so many more me's out there. You can talk about how the calls around the domestic violence has gone down, but I will tell you, the hospitals are not seeing sexual assault victims. That number has decreased, and that's because they're not going and they're not calling about it. And I can probably bet you nine times out of ten it's for the same reason that I gave you. 
Did I want to deal with sexual assault and, the, and what that comes with? Or do I want to die? I chose to live. So I'm going to ask you, are you committing to transform, to change our police department and take on the people's agenda for policing? That's a yes or no. Yes, and I'm sorry for letting you down. Oh, don't apologize. <laughs> you know why? Because you had an opportunity for something different. So I don't want your apologies. I just want your action. Thank you. Thank you. Imagine Yusuf, a world where you have to, please. Can I? Please. I just have to jump in again, yes, right? Because I'm sitting here listening, and anybody that knows me know that I've been on the front line for 25, 30 years. And I really want to know, my kid been beat up three times by the police. Can anybody raise their hand in here and say that they had that happen? Yep, mine been beat up three times. And my community, my community, know what they did about it? They didn't come and help me. I was begging for help, okay? You know what my community did? They videotaped it and they put it on Facebook and they laughed about it. And I had to figure it out for myself. So for everybody to stand up here, I still got one out there. You know where he at? The Justice Center. So I don't sugarcoat nothing. So while everybody coming, um, I'm just gonna say full disclosure, I got him out there. I've been out here, I'm from the communities, I'm from the neighborhood, been here 30 years, still gonna be here. So all of this, uh, who didn't, didn't nobody help me either. And I'm always out there trying to help people. And as far as the police department, I have no control over that. That's the mayor and the chief of police, okay? No, I, th I think that's why we're directly talking to the mayor and the chief. Um, there are things that the council can do, and we articulated what those are. Um, and we know what the council has done and is doing about it. And we encourage the council to get outside council because we don't trust in corporation council's ability to be able to do the right thing. I don't trust her. I don't think anybody else trusts her. And I think that you guys should really consider why We've she's still in force. already taken steps to do just that. So. I, I, just, I, I get you. I just want the record to be clear what we're directing our attention towards. We're completely cognizant. And I also want to say what I'm proud about these people here because these people are very explicit to whom they're directing their advocacy. We're specific because we recognize, and not a lot of other groups do this. So people did their homework. People did their homework with collecting stories, looking at budgets, and we shouldn't have to do that because we're not paid to do this. Well, I'm paid to do this, but a lot of the other people ain't paid to do this. And a lot of these people are collecting these narratives, and we want to get to their stories because what we're saying is, yes, we understand the, both what the council's role is, other groups will say, we want you all to address bail reform. That's not in your purview. We get that. But we're speaking to what the superintendent can do, which is why we're directing demands to the school board. These young people are going to get to that. We're speaking to what the mayor can do, what the chief can do, and what the council can do with specificity and clarity and, and precision. So I, I totally understand what you're saying, Common Council President. And I understand because, you know, I don't, I don't really talk as much as I'm beginning to about my own personal 16 years in Syracuse. But I, I, I empathize with the feeling that people haven't always been there, but we're here today. We are all here today. And we are all not gonna go away tomorrow. We're gonna continue to be here because we expect a different day in Syracuse. So we wanna talk about in the last demand, school resource officers, superintendent, Board president, we have these young people who have stories, but we did a little research here um, based on the school resource officer budget based off of the 2015 MOU, which is a memorandum of understanding with an assumption, because you don't post anything after that, with an assumption of 2% growth per year. We made that assumption because for the two years that you showed, it was a 2.27% increase, so we assumed that increased annually. What we did was break down the cost per teacher assistant and their salaries, which is 27350 Cost per social worker, including benefits, at 80000 Cost, and, and you want to come up to talk. Cost per SRO salary, 72995 
<laughs> cost per SRO, including benefits, $98,138. Again, per person that we send into the suburbs, subsidizing the suburb, suburban sprawl at the expense of the city. What that means is, for five SROs, we could have had 13.34 um, uh, teacher assistants, supportive staff. What that means is, and, and you know, sometimes people who, like, well, we don't want the, we don't want the SROs out of schools. We're not saying let it be a free-for-all. What we're saying is the people who should be responding, and I don't want to bring up your example of your son, Sharon, or Deputy Mayor, sorry, Deputy Mayor, but as a parent for, for, for a black boy who has a disability, I don't think that a police officer is adequate to respond to his crisis if he has the manifestation of his disability. Thank you, Coy. I don't think that that's adequate. In fact, we know it's not because they broke an arm for a young man who has a manifestation of his disability. My brother, who has a traumatic brain injury, and when he was having an episode, they tackled him, punched him in his head, locked him up, and brought him to CPAP. Seven police officers. That wasn't necessary, but it's what they do. And in one case, in Mr. Watkins, he's dead. So what we're saying is it's not just happening out in the community, superintendent. It's happening in your schools. And the refrain that's often brought up, and then we're going to bring the young people up to talk, because God bless you all, the work that you're all doing. Y'all doing something different. What is often said is, as has been said by some people in the community, a decision was made and no one listened to the teachers. Well, the decision hasn't been made, so it's just non-factual. Your executive order says to work with, right? I think it's number 16. Correct. It doesn't say a decision has been made, but the misinformation has already happened that you all have made a decision without engaging the teachers union. I want to reiterate this teacher union because I was there when Sharon Contreras was a superintendent. I went to those school board meetings. I didn't miss a school board meeting for years. Is that right, superintendent? Right. I don't think the people heard you. Yeah, you're right. And time and time again, people are talking about, well, we just need professional development. Did they show up to professional development? The teachers in Syracuse City School District, when, when you were the deputy superintendent, did they show up to professional development in requirement and fulfillment of the assurance of discontinuance? No, they didn't. It's a yes or no question. Some of them show up. Some of them we did it in, 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 in the buildings. Would you so. say 30% showed up? Would you say 50%? I have, I have to go back and... and okay, well, when do you think you'll be able to give those numbers? Because what you do a lot, Superintendent, yeah. is you say, I have to come back. But you never come back. Okay. I want to also reiterate... Because I watched the budget discussion with you when you said the district spends millions of dollars on these supportive services. What's the cost per student and how many students are serviced per those supportive services, for those contracts with social workers? It's a question that you should know off the top of your head as a superintendent. Well, you don't know it because it's not a priority. So my question to you, superintendent. We spend 4.5 million dollars in social workers in the district. Mm -hmm. And how many students are serviced? That serve the students at the elementary and the middle level. All of the Syracuse City School District students are serviced. How many students have had hours with social workers? That detail I don't have. How many hours say. have they had? That detail I don't have. And that's the problem, Superintendent, because we don't have an answer to that question. That is a misappropriation of resources. When you don't have an idea that you're surviving a contract and you have no clue. And I'm not talking about social work within the district. I'm talking about outside contract services. I'm talking about the social workers that we have in the district. Okay. okay. And so the outside contract services is what I'm referring to. The outside services, the contract that we have with the county that we pay $1.5 million to the county to provide support to our kids in the district. I will get the information of the contact hours. So to be clear, the information that you will get is how many hours, how many students are serviced, and how frequently yeah. they service. Because yeah. what we're getting is they didn't see me more than 20 minutes. Yeah. 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 $100,000 for eight students to get services for over a year. So to be clear, what these students and these young people have been elevating is not just the budgetary issues with the issues with respect to how we associate our resources, but also the justification that is given by the teachers union that has been resistant. That's not their words, that's my word. 
because I saw a teacher show up in blackface to protest Sharon Contreras. To be clear, as a Latino, una persona de Puerto Rico, tú sabes qué está pasando con esta comunidad. As a Puerto Rican, you know what's going on in this community. Do you know what's going on? As a, as a black woman who's a Puerto Rican, and I don't think a lot of people know I spoke Spanish, but as a black woman who's also Puerto Rican, who reflects the district and the demographic, she was ran out of town. And the protest to her was that she was making sure that students wouldn't be suspended in violation of their civil rights, of their constitutional right to a sound, not stellar, not dynamic, not amazing, not excellent, not outperforming basic education. And that's what we've been denying students according to the Court of Appeals in the city of Syracuse for decades. It's still in the courts, and you know this very well, Superintendent. So what these students are saying is we're focusing our attention on what the mostly white teachers who don't live in the city of Syracuse priorities are juxtaposed to the mostly black and brown students they're supposed to be servicing. The students who, as has been collected in their narratives, don't feel that they're valued. So I'm going to let them speak for themselves because they've got the information to share with you. So you all can please come up and thank you all for doing the work to collect those narratives. Good evening. Before Shukri speaks, I'm going to tell my story about my experience in school and policing. I understand that I go to a charter school, and I understand that means it's independent, but I don't understand that, that policing in my school has been so normalized to the point where it happened four years ago, and now my parents hear about it. That now my uncle looks me in the face and says, wow. I was in ninth grade. I was taking a class, a language class that I am required to take to pass high school. It was the middle of the day. And although when you hear my story, you might not understand why I am crying, but the fact that they told us to take out our bags in the middle of class, to shut down school, to tell us we can't go to the bathrooms for a good maybe 30 minutes, that we took our bags out, that they unzipped our bags. They brought police in, not security guards, not SROs. Police were called in, 911 was called in to, for a reason that I still to this day don't understand. I still to this day don't understand why police came into our schools to bring dogs, to go through our bags, to wear gloves. Like I am a criminal. I was 13, 14. There are eighth graders that go to my school. My high school starts at eighth grade. I don't understand why I was treated like a criminal, my teachers didn't know at the time. I asked my teacher, I said, why are police in my schools? Why are they armed? They were armed. I am a student. Look how tall I am. And think of me at 13, at 14. I'm not going to harm you. So the fact that you brought dogs in, that they were called in, that no, the 911 operator didn't think, why are we bringing these police and dogs in in the middle of the day and not taking care of it after school? where there aren't students trying to learn. I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to graduate. And the fact that that was not thought of, that that was not spoken about, the fact that I understand that yes, police might not want to be in my school and don't want to be called in, but no one thought for that second, why should we be answering now? Why it's 12.30, 11.30, this is the middle of a school day. Why am I coming in now? Why am I bringing in these dogs now when these kids are trying to learn? I still to this day have not got an answer from my school, from police, about why they were brought in. Apparently the rumor was it was we, we aren't allowed to have phones in our school. So it was a phone search. You don't need dogs for a phone search. I still don't understand. And there was a rumor that oh two students were taken out of class and they were they found drugs apparently in their bags. So if that is true, you took two students who were in my grade, and again, I was in ninth grade, took them out of school, and put them in the back of a police car or whatever, and arrested them and taken out of the class. And I still don't have an answer, and that frustrates me. Because again, this was ninth grade, but that was not my first experience with police. It was seventh grade, and I watched one of my peers get thrown into the back of a cop car and leave. 
I didn't see him for a week. We didn't know what happened to him. And I still, don't, to this day, don't know what happened to him. My sister goes to a city school. I am concerned because I don't know what her experiences will be. I am concerned because I hear my peers, look, this is not just a charter school issue. This is a issue in Syracuse. This is a city school issue. This is a out of district issue. This is a issue. And I am tired of not seeing it being handled. I am tired of not getting answers. I am tired of going home and not telling my parents because I just assume that they know. My mom found out two years ago, a year ago about the policing, about the dogs going in, about me being like searched and without my permission and my parents' permission. I'm a minor. I just, I don't understand. And again, I would like to clarify that I know a lot of people in this room have gone to city schools, have kids in city schools. And again, these are their stories. It is not that different from mine and what they have experienced. So I still, to this day, am scared for what my sister will experience. She's a black little girl. And I swear, I hope, I pray to God that she will not experience what I've experienced. The experience of just having police in my school being normalized, how people will assume that my experience with police will start in the street when no, it started in a school that I spent eight hours a day where my parents trust me to go, where they trust me to be safe and be educated, but I was not. And that is not my only story, but I will only share that one for tonight. But I have several stories of me being just taking my privacy away where I feel unsafe or where I feel to a point where just until now where I'm just like, wow, it was really normalized. It was really okay to me that these things happen. I just thought, well, everyone, it happens to everyone. And it clearly does, but it's not okay. I'll let Shukri talk now. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I was going to read this out, but I don't want to carry that burden. So I'm going to have people in the back of them. Um, Khadija, can you please read those two? Um, Aya, can you please read the one to your left? I had given this man no reason to pat me down. And he never should have to begin with. If anything, a woman has, it should have stepped in to do so. I feel violated and disrespected. All because the security guard had a random power trip. Black hair white FCSD and safety. As a white female kid, I was allowed into the school multiple times without security thinking I was a teacher or faculty. Or they just didn't care. All I had to do was tell them that I was a student and walk through the detention myself. All of my friends of color looked at me with disbelief in that and said this is a free pass. Never happened to them. White, my name. I remember hearing that one of the security officers at Can you read that one? <clears throat> and I'll let you guys read that one um, because it's not a burden for me to carry. <clears throat> Like, like uh, Yusuf said, and like Siri said, my name is Shakri. I'm an alumnus of Nottingham High School, class of 2017. I went to elementary school and middle school in the Syracuse City School District, and I currently go to Lemoyne College. I've been a resident of the city of Syracuse for a very, very, very long time. Um, so this, this issue of the removal of SROs is not a new matter. This is something that's been going on for a very long time. And to address something that superintendent said, while Valen Smith is a case that you were brought on while, and it happened while you were superintendent, in 2008, SRO Paul Kruger, Paul Kruger assaulted a 15-year-old girl at Corkin High School. These tears are not sad tears, these are angry tears. In, in November of 2008, 
Nike, the New York Civil Liberties put up three demands following Kruger's incident, to which one of them was asking the city and the district to create a tracking mechanism to monitor police presence in the schools and record relevant details of incidents involving police-student interaction. It is not adequate to rely solely on the Syracuse Police Department to internally record and analyze such information. The system must be made accessible to the public. End quote. That was from 2008. Again, Valen Smith, 2017, Nottingham High School, Jabari Boykins. Despite the DA saying that he did not use excessive force, this kid's arm was broken. I don't know what excessive force means to all of you, but breaking an arm, that is force. In a petition that was put out by CNY Solidarity Coalition with over 1,000 signatures, they stated, we demand policies and improved training for all SROs in the district and specifically relating to service, serving students with special needs following Valen Smith's incident. Now, Valen Smith's incident wasn't even brought up until the community spoke out. When that incident happened, why didn't SPD and the Syracuse City School District do something immediately? Why did it have to take the whole community to speak up on a topic? when a kid's arm was broken. I don't know about all of you guys, but I know for the mayor, you have a child. If, a, if your child's arm was broken, I know you would be up in arms. And I know you would address this immediately. So why wasn't that situation addressed when it happened? Why is he still on the force? How is that supposed to make me feel? I'm an alumni, I have three little brothers. Correction, I have four little brothers. That's how I lose my mind when I talk about these things. I have four little brothers. And to think that any of them could be Jabari walking through Nottingham's hallways frustrates me so much that for the past few months I have not gotten enough rest because I know that something could happen to them at any time including when they're at school, when my parents and myself are supposed to think that they're safe. When they're supposed to be at school learning to be successful young men in our community. Well, how are they supposed to be successful if they're dying? How are they supposed to be successful in the hospital with a broken arm, missing school? And God forbid if, he, if any of my siblings have mental health issues, because the school certainly doesn't address it. You talk about having counselors in our school and advocating, what, four million? 1.5 from the Onondaga County. I attended Nottingham. I don't remember mental health being talked about at all. I don't remember counselors being available. Counselors? You mean the guidance counselors? The four that served 1,200 students? 1,200 students and only four guidance counselors? What are they supposed to help with with mental health, college and career? No, because they're, supposed, they're dealing with students scheduling. They're st dealing with students having issues throughout the day. So when, where are we supposed to get this help from? SROs? Because no, that is not their job. Because according to the contract, according to the contract between Syracuse City School District and SPD, unless there's an immediate threat of violence, the decision to involve the SPD in any school-based incidents must be made by a principal or designee. In the case of an immediate threat of violence, any school employee may request police assistance. Now, if a student has a breakout in the, in the middle of class, something happens, and it's mental health related, and the, stu and, the, and the teacher can't address it, we're supposed to call an SRO who isn't trained in it? We're supposed to call an SRO to come talk to these students? Are they supposed to be our friends? Because that's not in their contract. So what are we supposed to do in the schools? What? Please tell me, what are we supposed to do? So I have three questions for Chief Buckner, Superintendent Alisea, and President of the Board of Education. Will you remove SROs from the school district? That's a yes or no question. As I said before, we're gonna do a survey and we are going to get feedback from all the stakeholders. Here's the survey that you're looking for. We want the removal of SROs. I'm not sure if you've been following the news, because I've done three interviews now. I've done a number of articles with Syracuse.com, CNY Central, whoever. And if you look at the people who support, pretty much all of Syracuse, 
students and their parents included support the removal of SROs. Removal of SROs from our schools because clearly they're not doing their job. Clearly they're there for no other reason than just to pick up pension and just to pick up their paycheck. And you didn't answer my question. Will you remove SROs from the school district? And I'm giving you the survey that you're looking for. The school board has to be together to discuss this and, and we are committed to having at our next meeting this discussion. Okay, so let's say that you are going to meet with the Board of Education. When should we expect that meeting? We are gonna set that agenda on the 8th and it's gonna be either at our work session on the 22nd or on the 27th. And August 8th or July 8th? No, 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 July 8th is when we set the agendas. Okay. And we're gonna set the agenda for either the 20, July 22nd or July 27th and those agendas will be public. And when should we expect an answer from you? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, it was addressed to you though. I, I, can't, I can't give you an answer without the entire board. Um, so clearly that's not the answer I that we're looking well, for. I think you should be able to expect an answer either at that meeting or right after. We're going to definitely set up a timeline. Okay, so before August. Yes. Okay, so y'all heard it live. So we're going to be expecting an answer <coughs> by, uh, by the beginning of August and end of July. You're going to have an answer about what our plan is. You're going to have an answer about what our plan is. Okay. Yes. Second question, will you implement mental health counseling into our schools by the beginning of the school year 2020? Yes. In addition to what we already have, are you asking? I didn't, like I said, we don't have enough. That I, that I definitely agree with. And should we expect that answer the same time? We, I don't want this to sound like, um, I don't want it to sound like a politician answer, but I will say this. We are, as a board, fully committed to having mental health counselors in our schools. We think it's especially important now with having been home since March because we think that our students, in addition to the educational needs that they have, are going to have, on top of that, being home, having to deal with all of that. So we've been having these discussions since March. Our challenge, to be honest with you, is budgetary and we have an additional challenge on top of that because the governor is going to take back money as our school year goes so we are absolutely committed to having as much mental health as we can and I, I see Yusuf has that budget right there um, so yeah we're committed to it and we just have to make the dollars work <clears throat> we'll be very careful and to be looking forward to that because we expect that to happen by the beginning of the school year. Like you said, students have been affected by COVID-19 and they will be affected September when they have to start school. Absolutely. And to touch, mm, never mind. Will you involve the community and student voices when deciding the next steps of what will replace SROs and law enforcement? And just to, just to add on to that, what to Nikita was saying, we need to have community leaders in our schools. Yeah, we want to take out SROs, and you want to an answer for what would replace it? Community leaders. That's who's going to replace it. And to Yusuf's point, SROs, police officers, are taking money from our city and taking them to CNS, FM, and JD, for what reason? No other reason than just to take their kids to a better school. Why? Because our schools are failing because of them. Because of them. This is why our schools are failing, and you're telling me that you, you know what? No, we're not gonna touch on that. We're not gonna touch on that. But one more thing, Chief Buckner, to Yusuf's point, my cousin is the one that's in the hospital right now. And your police officers are refusing to meet with him to figure out what happened with that gun, what happened with that shooting. It's been how many days now? Since Sunday. Since Sunday. And we've yet to hear any news of why he's in, why he's in the hospital with the gunshot wound. Is there a reason? What is stopping to police officers from investigating these things? The 10% cut that's in their budget? 
because that's disrespectful to me. That's my own cousin. That's blood. And you're telling me he's going to stay in that hospital, and we won't know what's happening with him for a very long time because the, because the police department has 10% budget to go investigate criminals? Keep that in mind, because these are family members. And I don't know if any of you guys have family members. I'm ass- I, know, I know the mayor does, and I'm assuming every person on this board does too. When you make a decision, and it involves family members. I hear so many times that Syracuse community is supposed to be a family. So when you, ama- when you make a decision, you are affecting family members. Remember that, because we put you, I didn't even put you here. I wasn't able to vote. And honestly speaking, if I were to vote, I probably would have voted for you guys because y'all gave me hope, especially you two. Because y'all look like me. I'm trying to be in your position too. I'm studying political science so I can be like you guys and make good decisions. So it saddens me to see when you guys, when you aren't able to do something because the system is stopping you or you aren't able to make a good decision for whatever reason. It disappoints me, and I hope that you all can do so much better. And I must, must feel there. Thank you, Shukri. We, we really only have time for two more comments. Um, for context, um, Superintendent, I just want to remind you, um, because we're talking about Valen Smith, it's not just about Valen Smith, it's a pattern of practice. But in the case of Valen Smith, you expressed to us that you didn't know who he was before he came into the schools. There's four of us who were in that meeting here today. And in that discussion, I had to express to you that prior to him being in the school for breaking the arm of a student with an IEP, which is an individualized education plan, which is typically associated with a student who has a disability, mm-hmm. he discharged his weapon as someone who was fleeing. The same very type of action that resulted in the death of Mr. Rashad Brooks. To put this into context, that's who we thought was, should be in a school. Prior to that, and not like years or decades, like weeks prior to that, this individual also went across the street, not because the individual was in front of them, He went across the street Mm -hmm. to assault an individual. And what the chief talked about in the case of um, Shaolin Moore to alluded to that in, I guess, what is a low density punch. I'm being facetious to make a point. Punch the individual, put him in arrest for doing what's the First Amendment Supreme Court constitutional right to record a police encounter. That's who we thought was fit to be in a school. He is not the only person. She mentioned Officer Kluge, who was the head, as I understand, the SRO program at that time. And so this is a pattern and practice. In fact, almost all of the litigation that we at the NYCLU have been involved that addressed changing the policy was because of school resource officers who engaged in violence against students by tasering them, which caused a change to the taser policy, and putting them in chokeholds was called a change to the chokehold policy. And for the idea that you can't unequivocally, without any sort of clarity, express is not disappointing. It's, a, it's really an offense to what these comments are. And we as a community deserve better. Because we didn't just put in the context with what the issue with the SRO program, this is a systemic issue that drains resources out of the city of Syracuse to fund for other communities that we have said is acceptable for decades and generations. And we are saying that can't happen any longer. You all should have been saying it. You all should have been doing that work. Not talking about process, not talking about you know, what impediments are. You find out solutions. That is what we hire you to do. And why we're here is to reassert the balance in this community. Because it's incumbent upon the community to understand that you are public servants. Public servants. The community doesn't have that notion that you are to serve the interests of the public. That is what you're entitled to do. 
He paid you a very well good salary, not the council. Right. Just to be clear. Uh, right. I just want to be fair here, okay? Really be with you on that one, okay? I'm just, people should have a living wage, okay? But the rest of you make pretty, pretty well, you also aren't paid. So to be fair, you're voluntary. Well, you got some small stipend. Um, but that said, many of the officials here get pretty over $100,000 salary. It's a pretty well-paying jobs. And what we're saying is that if you're going to be able to make that money, then you have to have the responsibility to make sure that these demands are met. There's no way we should justify their tears with, we'll get back to you. It should have been, I, you should have already thought about this before you came to this meeting and said, here's what we're putting into place today. You should have been thinking about it because this moment required you to. This isn't the first time that she's had these demands. It's not the first time the community's made any of these demands. What we're saying, why we're saying we're not, business as usual is over, is because quite frankly, the time has come, and Marissa said it so clearly, it's not about reform, we gotta transform this baby. Because this ship ain't sailing in the right direction. We are going towards a direction that is not towards the public health and safety of the citizens of the city of Syracuse. And you are either a part of the solution, or you're facilitating for the problem. And I'm not looking at any of you because I'm saying you are particularly, just, I'm just trying to be fair in my looks. <laughs> um, and so the last uh, two people, um, TJ is gonna talk about the Citizens Review Board because we're talking about reclaiming civilian oversight over policing because we don't think the police department and certainly the police union is equipped to address accountability issues. We have seen time and time again the inability to be able to respond to concerns that people have raised to not follow with process that's written in legislation. The council has created two sets of legislation on the Citizens Review Board. And I want to remind people that in the, in the uh, first act of Steve Thompson, former counselor, former police chief, former, excuse me, disgraced police chief, um, Steve Thompson, when he came to the council, the very first act that Corporation Council helped him to facilitate was the D. Um, the, the disempowerment of the Citizens Review Board. That was my first time coming to the council to talk about the Citizens Review Board. Organized people, they showed up. And the Citizens Review Board, the defeat of it was failed. And then again, in his last hurrah, before he left the council, he tried to do the very same thing. Is that true? And it wasn't just him by himself. It was with the help of Corporation Council. And this is why it's, we can say that the institution of the position of corporation counsel is not towards addressing people's issues. Because time and time again, whether it's comments in the press about justification for excessive force, whether it's time and time again about abuse of power, whether it's time and time again about reform and efforts to change things, they have not engaged in those efforts. So TJ is gonna talk about the issues with the CRB. Um, uh, this, the, the woman who, who was going to speak left, um, and, then, and then we're going to close, and this has been over the time that we've thought, but this has been a productive, hopefully, conversation. Okay, if she comes back, we'll make sure she's the last person. TJ. Yeah, so every story I heard today, I don't know about y'all, but it's traumatic to me. It hurts, it, it physically makes me sick to hear that, right? So when we sit, when we come here, and we, tell, and we have these people tell y'all stories just like we did last year at the community forum, right? Right? So when we say the same thing, and y'all sit here and at all these events and say, hey, I'm, I'm with y'all, I want that stuff to stop too, I, I support it, of course, of course, well, let, well, let me, well my question is why? Was in any in anything that was ever that was addressed by y'all? Uh, why was none of it about police consequences and accountability for the police officers? Right? Because when they when it, for fireworks, y'all was quick with it. Y'all was real quick with it. Y'all was like, "Oh, we gonna arrest them. We got a task force." Da -da -da. The whole community literally cried to y'all last year. They cried to y'all last year. And just now, you saying, "Oh, we gonna do an executive order that's gonna." Tell police that the chief, when he decides not to listen to the CRB, 
that, oh, well, he just, just gave a written reason why. That's really the best you could do? That's the best you could do to tell me that I'm going to be safe when I leave this room? That's the best? That's the best? I'm like, they literally crying to you. So when y'all say, oh, I understand, we know y'all don't understand. We know y'all don't understand. We don't. We, we know y'all don't understand. And so, and let me ask y'all this, right? So, which, uh, and actually, for this, for this for you, Chief. So, you would say, right, a, a criminal is somebody who breaks the law, by definition, right? Yes, sir. You would say that. All right. So, let me, let me pull this out real quick. All right? So, according to Google, a gang is an, an organized group of criminals, right? So, when we talk, when earlier, when you said there were consequences to things regarding the budget, I want y'all to keep that same consistency when officers here break the law. Because there wouldn't be a need for a citizen review board if y'all was holding them accountable when they broke the law. And, and I know y'all gonna say, oh, well, according to the policies, they didn't really break the law. Well, you know how I know you're lying? Because y'all wouldn't have paid the millions in civil lawsuits over the last decade if they didn't break the law. You see what I'm saying? So when I, so when I hear police, I hear organized group of criminals who have been documented breaking the law. All right, so that's, so that's where I'm coming from. So let me get to this demand. Today, the community is demanding that you immediately draft legislation and policy that empowers the Citizen Review Board with, enforcement, with the power to enforce their recommendations for discipline when they sustain findings of misconduct while preserving the body of a citizen-led board. All right, I'm gonna say that a few times to make sure everybody remember it. All right, so let me just give you a couple of stats. Because right now, the if, if, if I was to go out today at leaving this meeting and somebody shot me dead and, they have, and he was an officer, right? For no reason, unprovoked. I didn't do nothing, I didn't say nothing, I wasn't questioned. So my family goes and files a complaint to the Citizen Review Board, and the best of Citizen Review Board is make a recommendation for you, and you reply, I, I dealt with it adequately, right? And of course, that was some 50A and all that other stuff, whatever, whatever. But we need a community-led citizen board that has the power to enforce their recommendation. It shouldn't be, accountability shouldn't be a question, right? It shouldn't be a question. It should be a requirement. It should be zero tolerance for that. So let me give you some more stats. So there was a total of, and I'm gonna use the 2018's review board summary, right? Because 2019 is not on the site yet. So there were, there were 85 complaints made about police misconduct in 2018. Even though black people, according to the 2010 census, only make up 30% of the Syracuse population, they made up 70% of the complaints about police wrongdoing. So keep that in mind. So 40% of those complaints were about police brutality. 34% of those complaints were about racial profiling. Of the 15 sustained findings, in 2018, the chief of police only agreed with one. And when I say he agreed with one, I, didn't mean, I don't mean he took the recommendation. I mean, he said, oh, I thought they did something wrong. Right? Right? So the whole point of having a citizen review board is because the community decides how the people they're paying are performing. Right? And they say what the consequences are for misperforming and killing and harming and continually raping our community. Because y'all don't heard it. I don't know if y'all think people lying. I don't know if y'all think people making this up. These tears is real. This pain is real. I'm not, we nobody here for fun. Nobody here because we personally got a beef, because we mad at two, because we mad. I don't even know y'all like that. I don't. I don't. Y'all don't know me. The only reason I'm here right now in front of all of y'all is because I need y'all to say right now that within the capacity of each one of you here, that you will fully support and endorse the people's demands. And I don't mean, and I don't mean, oh, well, I can't say it now. Because, because of the process, because what it looks like when you support is you say, I will do everything within my power to make sure it happens. Y'all won't say, well, I can't say that yet. Y'all will say, regardless of what the laws say, I will tell you right now that I will do everything within my public capacity to make that happen. So when, people, so when the community and the, and the kids that came up and say, oh, we disappointed in y'all, it's because y'all haven't done that yet. Y'all haven't done that yet. The shooting that happened a couple of weeks, I heard they made arrests. Why, 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 why was Chester Thompson not arrested? Why was Valon Smith not arrested? They broke the law, right? Or is, or is, that, or is that a gray area for y'all? Because it ain't a gray area in civil court. 
So I don't understand. So when y'all talk about, oh, y'all, y'all really care and y'all concerned, it's, it's, it's hard for the community to believe that. And to keep it a buck, Chief, I really feel like you don't care about us. I'm going to keep it a buck with you because last year when you said, oh, basically said, oh, the officer ain't do nothing wrong with Shalomar but cuss at him. You told me that if an officer did the same thing to me tomorrow, as, as long as he don't cuss at me, it's all right. That's what you said to me. Or when Mr. Watkins got killed and they quoted you in the paper. And, they, and you said, oh, he had a gun. It's business as usual. When is killing somebody business as usual? That was in Syracuse.com. You said, oh, it wasn't no, it wasn't no wrongdoing. It was, it was business as usual. When is killing an, older, an elderly, it killing anybody business as usual? So when you said that, I knew, I knew from that moment you ain't care about us. I knew. And I'm never going to feel like any of y'all care about us until y'all say we support and fully support the people's agenda and we'll do everything within our power to make it happen. Because like Yusuf said, y'all are public servants. It's not about, hey, well, what, 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 what within this agenda do I want to do that I feel comfortable with? What within this agenda do I want to not do because I'm friends with the person and might, and might unemploy? It's not about that. It's what can I do to make sure I address what my constituents, the people who put me here, the people who pay for me to be here, say that they want done. And how can I do that and exceed that? Nothing less. Now, how can I do that to, to, to placate them so they don't ask me about it no more? So when we, talk about, when we talk about accountability in the Citizen Review Board, it is explicitly because we have no faith that y'all will hold these officers accountable. Same way y'all hold the people who had the fireworks accountable. Same way y'all, y'all held the shooters accountable. We want consistency. Consistency. We don't want, well, my, my predecessors did this. My predecessors did that. That's they fault. This was before me. Because you know what accountability, accountability really looked like? It's, it's, it's y'all coming in here saying, me, in my position, fully disowned and disagree with the actions that were committed by these officers. That's what y'all could do. If, even, if, even if it's not within your scope, that's how you use your public servant platform to say, I stand and serve my community with whatever they're asking for. And if they're telling you that this public servant, whoever they are, and we know there were many, are a danger to me, have harmed me, have killed me, have raped me, have murdered my family, the response needs to be, we are going to hold them accountable. The same way you would hold somebody accountable, they selling drugs on the street. Because I, I, I don't understand how... <sighs> no, I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about that. I'm not even going to talk about that. I'm, 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 make, I'm, I'm trying to make this quick. So let me just, let me just read a complaint to you. Right, because I, I gave y'all an example of me randomly being attacked on the street. Right, so let me let me read a, a, a case that was written and submitted to the CRB in 2018 in the report. All right, so the complainant was driving a vehicle down a street on the city's south side while playing music, and the, and the Syracuse Police Department initiated a traffic stop. The complainant stopped at a traffic light, and two police cars surrounded his vehicle. Both officers jumped out of their respective cars with their weapons drawn. The officers then began to order the complainant to release his seatbelt while another officer reached into the vehicle and pulled him out of the car onto the street. Both officers began to kick, punch, and slam the complainant's head into the pavement. Hold on, hold on. Y'all heard, y'all heard that, right? It wasn't a, hey, you're being charged. It wasn't a, hey, you're being arrested. Stop resisting. It was, they took him out the car and, <clears throat> and, and proceeded to kick, punch, and slam the complainant's head into the pavement. The complainant was bleeding a great deal from his head, and he was handcuffed while lying on the street. Although the complainant was restrained, the officers continued to beat, kick, and punch him while yelling, stop resisting. Sounds like something that just happened a couple days ago, right? (sighs) Yeah. So the complainant states he was not resisting, and the beating did not stop until the blood was seen coming from his head. They then asked if they could search his vehicle and recovered nothing. He was transported to the Justice Center for booking, but they refused to accept him without medical treatment, so he was transported to the hospital and given an appearance ticket. You know how badly they had to beat him? That he had to go to the hospital? And and at any point in this story, did you hear any wrongdoing? Because I didn't. Did you hear any justification for nearly beating a man to death 
randomly who was driving down the south side playing music. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear, the only, the only command I heard was stop resisting after they already had was beating him. After he was already restrained. That's crazy. You put it up there telling us, man. So when we talk about accountability in a citizen review board, again, we need this we need you to immediately draft legislation and policy that empowers a citizen review board with the enforcement of their recommendations for discipline when they sustain findings of misconduct while preserving a body of a citizen led board. The first calls for the citizen review board started forty one years ago. after a man was killed, right? So 41 years since then, and we're still calling for strengthening the Citizen Review Board. We, we still don't have trust in our elected officials to hold officers accountable. After 41 years of hearing every politician publicly say, I don't condone violence. I support the community. I support communities of color. I stand with them. You stand with them, but we don't never hear you stand with us when the police beating us. Y'all always on the other side giving excuses. Y'all never saying, hey, I don't, I don't run a department, but I'm standing here saying, chief, we got to do something. Y'all don't do that. Y'all don't do that. Y'all don't. Y'all don't. And anything less than that, we will only ever perceive as a public and official sanction of all of that behavior that these police have been doing to us. Because anything less than coming out and say, I unequivocally disagree and do not condone this behavior, is saying I'm signing off. Everyone, whether it's in your scope or not. Because if you're silent in a public position that you are elected to, you are complicit. We can all, we can all say behind closed doors, we support each other. Oh, I, I, really, I really disagree, but you know, you know, I just can't, I can't say that. There's two sides. There's no two sides of abuse, rape, murder, and pillaging. There's no, there's no two sides. There's no two sides. It's not. What two sides of the story do I need to hear? What other side of the story do I need to hear to justify them randomly pulling up on this man and beating him to death? What's the, what's the other side of the story do I need to hear for justifying Chester Thompson, Chester Thompson raping a woman and other women prior to that? What, what justification? Why are we still debating this? What, what, so when y'all sit here again, and I'm, and I'm going to keep saying this, when y'all sit here and say, I support y'all, I can't believe it. Because y'all, as far as I know, y'all heard these stories already last year. And y'all still haven't said y'all disagree. And I know y'all haven't said y'all disagree because the officer haven't been fired yet. They haven't been arrested yet. And yes, you can say, oh, well, it's the district attorney's fault. Well, I haven't heard you call him out. I haven't heard you say our district attorney needs to do something. Y'all all have public platforms. Y'all can say this is wrong, not because it's my political stance, because it's my moral stance. Whether, whether, I'm, whether people don't want to elect me next year, whether people don't want to elect me or anything, none of that should matter. It should be about what is morally just. When y'all talk about doing surveys, People, but they just told you a, a young child was, felt like she was sexually assaulted. They just told you that. You talking about you want to do a survey. You want to survey a community where only 30% of the community is receiving 80% of the harm. But you want to survey the whole community. You know what that survey is going to turn out like. It's going to be 70% of people who say, I can't relate. So don't come saying y'all want to do surveys. Y'all need to investigate. Again, y'all heard all this last year. The community, again, it's the, y'all are public service. It's the community's job to tell y'all what they want. Not for y'all to come and say, well, you, you say you want this, but I think you want this. That's not y'all's job. And until y'all do that and say that y'all publicly and fully and completely, not in a compromising, not, well, I got to put it through the process. We, we already told you that the process disenfranchises us. The process is what hurt us. The process is what allows us to continue to hurt. So again, if y'all do support us, if y'all do, if, if, if for each one of y'all, if y'all personally feel that black and brown lives do matter, then we need you to today, fully and completely, without limits, say, 
I support the people's agenda. And if you can't do that, and, and if you can't do that, then you, you, what, what you've also said is, I don't support the people. I support what's comfortable for me within my elected role, and screw y'all. That's it. That's it. <sighs> That's all I got to say. So, what's, 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 what, is, what is it? Do y'all support the people's agenda today? Now, we can go over all the details. You can, we, can, we can all bring the community and say, okay, well, hey, guys, we got to figure out this part. We can, all, we can all do that. But I need y'all to say that personally to the maximum of your current capacity that you will fully and unquestionably and uncompromisingly support the people's agenda because they told you that is what they need to feel safe and valued in this city. So will y'all say that? I'm going to say this. I'm not going to anybody. You can look at Syracuse.com. You'll see my position. I don't need to stand here and tell you what I support because I didn't put myself on the line supporting all of it. I hear that. I hear that. But we want to hear you tell your colleagues that. They self. I'm speaking for me. But that's, that, but that's, that's what I'm saying. It's not about anybody's personal stance. It's not about that. But, but that's what you just said. You said in my role, and in my role, I've taken that stance. In my role. So do you support the people's agenda in full? OpenSyracuse.com. Is, is, that, is that a yes, ma'am? Everyone else? Do y'all fully support the people's agenda? So I, I would take it as right now you're saying that you do not support the people's agenda for the community and do not value black and brown individuals in this city. Respectfully, I believe that I've, I've given my, I've provided my position on each one of these items on the agenda and, and in doing so, I support black and brown lives in Syracuse. So what, so what you just did, Mayor, was say, I heard you tell me what you need, and then I told you what I'm willing to give you. Okay. That's not support. Okay. If, I'm, if, I tell, if I tell you my leg is broken, and you say, well, I'm gonna give you some candy, how is that helping me? I understand. How is that showing me so you care about me? It's not. That's why we're not taking that. So, so, so just, just to be clear, and I, I, mean, I guess people are saying, Ms. Hudson, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what your statement is. I'm not, I'm not hearing it now. I don't know. Well, my Again, statement is, as I told you, I said it in Syracuse.com. I, I, I publicly spoke about the Slime Moore case. I publicly speak about things that's out there. I'm publicly, my little black son is, is out there probably with you, probably getting beat up more than anybody you know, okay? Publicly. Ma'am, again, I, I, don't, I don't know what you said. Um, but all I'm saying today is, does, does everyone support and fully support the people's agenda within your capacity? And will do your best to ensure that the needs of the community are met today? Young man, I'm going to say this. I'm going to do my best every single day that I come into my office and outside of my office. In my capacity to support the items here. What is not black and white for me is how to do it, how, how long it's going to take, how to get it done. So it's hard for me to say black and white, every single aspect of this document. But am I going to work hard to look at every single one of these items to be able to address them? Yes, I am. Am I going to be able to fully meet what you all expect as a requirement? Probably not. I've just got to just say that to you. But I'm going to work just like I do every day. I appreciate that, and again, this is, I don't know, I don't know your person like that, so it's not a personal attack, but, but again, the, the framing is that if you wholeheartedly say that you agree, we can figure out the obstacles later, mm -hmm. but nobody here has said they 100% agree with the police, the, the people's agenda. It's, we're not saying y'all don't care at all. We ain't saying none of that. We're saying we are hurting. 
This is how you fix that hurt. This is the first step to doing that. And if y'all can't say that, hey, I am, I, regardless of what obstacles come, I will work in my capacity knowing that the end I am working towards is meeting the people's agenda. But, but saying anything less than that, saying, well, I'm going to stop right here because I know I'm going to have an obstacle or so-and-so won't agree with me is not supporting the people's agenda. Young man, I've always worked for the people's agenda. And I'll continue to work for the people's agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be honest yeah, with is. you and tell you that I don't know how I will make things happen, like you said, yeah, obstacles, yeah. but I, I do support and I am thinking about things very differently after tonight, so I wanted to thank everyone for that as well. So you support the people's agenda? I do. So, so can you say that, please? I support the people's agenda. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? And I came here with an open mind to listen to all of you. And I value and respect the black and brown people in our community. And I will do everything and I will continue to do everything to support the people's agenda that black and brown people of the kids that we have in our community. I think I'm last here. I'm, I'm committed to improving. Uh, I cannot say definitively that I 100% support everything uh, that, that you have said because I have not seen what everything looks like in detail. Uh, so I would not feel comfortable to committing to that. So you don't support the committee? In your definition, that's a no. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Mayor, so I, I'm here I know to listen and to support. I know no, you said you here. did your 16 points, we're here. and you Doesn't feel like you've addressed that, you know, it, but again, that, that is you telling the people what's going to make them feel better. And they've told you what will make them feel better. By myself. So again, please, will you support fully, to the full extent of your capacity, the people's agenda? I believe I've been clear with my response. So that is Just no. each one of those. So that is no? I believe I've been clear in my response. You can... You can it, ba ba based on ba based on what your interpretation of a no is, then it would be a no. Okay. All right. All right. So last point: When can we expect you to draft legislation and policy that empowers the Citizen Review Board with the enforcement of their recommendations for discipline when they sustain findings of misconduct while preserving the body of a citizen-led board? I think that we need to have a meeting because the administration doesn't control the Citizen Review Board. It's the City Council. And I think a lot of folks don't understand that and they go to the mayor's office. So I think we need to have a sit down to talk about the legislation with the council. Okay, okay, so let me, let me phrase it differently. Do you all support, do you, are you, do you or you all agree to within your full capacity and the role that you play immediately draft legislation or support the drafting and legislation of policy that empowers the Citizen Review Board with the enforcement of their recommendations for discipline when they sustain findings of misconduct while preserving the body of a citizen-led review board. If that is not within your power, what that looks like is saying publicly, I believe that we need to immediately draft legislation and policy that empowers the Citizen Review Board with the enforcement of their recommendations for discipline when they sustain findings of misconduct while preserving the body of a citizen-led board. So if that is not within your power to do, the appropriate response would be, I fully support it and publicly stating that. And following up with your colleagues publicly saying, why haven't y'all got a, why haven't y'all addressed this yet? So when we come back, when we come back and say, hey, what's been done? Instead of y'all just being like, oh, well, that's, that's their thing, that's their thing. Y'all should be asking the questions right there with us. Why hasn't this been done yet? That's what it looks like to really be on a community side. So I, I think you said that's, 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 that's for the council. So, but, I, but again, I'll ask, I'll ask you, actually. But I would like to sit down with you and Yusuf and Raynette and the council because that's where we're going to get the legislation drawn is okay. with the council. So I, I, I need a hard commitment from someone here about how that's going to happen. I'm a commitment. 
So and I, I just want I want to be clear because I I thought that I had been, but I'm I'm going to try to be clearer. Uh, the each I believe that we are aligned and 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 I am in support of the desired outcomes of each one of these uh, of each one of these demands. I do not think that we necessarily agree on the specific way in which we get to those outcomes. So again, to be clear, if that is your if if in saying that your your definition is that I'm saying no, then I, I accept that. But I believe that we're trying to get to the same place. And, and uh, specifically as it relates to the Citizens Review Board, if you're asking me if I support the Citizens Review Board being able to enact discipline mm -hmm. on police officers, I do not believe that that's the right role of the Citizens Review Board. So we are currently litigating how a, a new way to, to discipline officers that involves public hearing, that involves accountability, the chief and I are completely committed to improving the way in which we discipline our officers, but, but that does not involve the Citizen Review Board directly levying discipline on officers. It involves the Citizens Review Board providing oversight over the police department and providing recommendations of which we have committed to allowing, to, we have committed to ensuring that the Citizens Review Board recommendations are taken into consideration by the chief before the chief makes the decision on discipline, but it will be the chief that makes the decision on discipline. So you do not support the people's agenda? You, it, you do not support strengthening the Citizen Review Board? I support strengthening the Citizen's Review Board. No, 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 no. Let me, let me read it exactly. Uh, that, you do not support strengthening the Citizen Review Board with the ability to enforce <laughs> their recommendations for discipline when they sustain findings of misconduct while preserving the body of a citizen-led board. You do they, not think that is the right for the people to decide how their public servants are serving. But, Based on my understanding of what you just said, I do not support Citizens Review Board being able to enact discipline directly. I'm more than willing to work with you and with the Common Council to, uh, to better understand how we can empower the Citizens Review Board and improve the process, uh, but, but based on my understanding of what, of what you just read, I don't, I don't support that. And the answer is no for me as well. I, it, there, I, I did hear the, rep, the term adjudication. I do want to reference it. The process that we've, that we've laid out, uh, there is, if, if when the chief levies, the dis, di, levies discipline, uh, the, the process for challenging that decision uh, involves a public hearing and involves an adjudicating officer, not police officer, and adju, uh, in, uh, essentially a judge that will make a, that will make a determination. So again, I'm happy to talk about that process, uh, and, and, and ultimately you, you can decide if that's the process that you support, uh, but that's, just, that's the process that we're currently litigating. I'm gonna just intervene because we, we have really exceeded the time, and I wanna be respectful of people's time. I'll say two very quick comments. First, the adjudication process very rarely ever goes against the, the ability for police to be held accountable almost always results in maintaining lack of discipline for officers. I think this specific question that TJ was asking is not about process, not about whether or not you are going to find an obstacle down the road. I think Sharon, you really answered it clearly. And I think that, like, I want to just be clear because I think that's a fair answer. I think it's a fair answer. It's a respectable answer. I think it's an answer. And I think I heard Katie and Helen also, and Chief, we heard you. I'm not really sure what you think, Superintendent, but that's another question for another day. Um, but I, I, and, 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 and Helen, I think we understood what you express as your role and capacity in council. I'm not going to meet with you all individually. I think we will. We are a group, so we will meet collectively. But I want to give Yvonne, really we are, are exceeded the time, um, and I, pr I promised that we would be respectful of people's time, and I apologize for breaching that. Um, but please, Yvonne. Okay, so Jaime knows me, the school board president. I'm Yvonne Griffin. You finally met me. You met me last June. You finally met me last June, but I did leave a message for you January of 2018. Helen, you know me, and Deputy Sue, what's your name? Sharon. Oh, uh, Sharon Owens, yes, I'm Yvonne Griffin. <laughs> so, you said, what did you say about the CRB recommendations? I would oppose. I'm just wondering because I know on January 12th of 2018, when you became mayor, 
You came afterwards. I know that it says, in the matter of Yvonne Griffin versus Officer 1 and 2, CRB, CRB case numbers 17019 and 03009, I had two different case numbers for the CRB because when I was in Janesville, somebody decided to go ahead and actually submit another CRB complaint off of a 2002 CRB complaint while I was in jail. And they actually, like, while I was doing my day. So they ended up giving me the CRB hearing uh, 18 years later. But it says, Dear Ms. Griffin, in accordance with our authorizing local law, a CRB panel met on January 11th to review the above captioned matter. After careful review of the testimony and facts submitted, which everything was submitted by Yvonne Lee Griffin, we all know this, it says excessive, excessive force sustained against officer one and two. So they use excessive force to kill my kids' father. Then withholding personal information for medical staff because I'm not understanding how someone has a warrant inside his name that's signed by Judge Rosenthal and a warrant that is issued there to the house also signed by Judge Rosenthal the same day that the raid took place. I don't understand why they didn't tell the doctors his name even though I'm the one who put the videotape out there of the Justice Center, because I was able to get it. And in the booking area, the nurse declined entry to the jail because my baby father was so severely messed up. Then denial of a next of kin notification in timely matters. So what they did is that they raided my kids' father's mother's house. They beat him, took him first, took his mother and his three cousins afterwards, about 40 minutes later, um, on a videotape that was actually altered, and you, you said the Common Council runs the CRB? And I've been sitting here saying that with Stephanie Minor who sat there and altered my videotape. Well, we don't alter tape. Oh, no, see, it. let me go ahead and tell you when Joseph Lapari was here. See, the videotape that I gave the CRB was the original one. That the room across the hall, I the lawyer's it. office, they gave it to me. So back then in 02, we had VCR time. So that means it's down here on the left-hand side. 2014, Joseph, I gave him permission to take it to the Color Industrial Labs to go ahead and get it updated on DVD. So what happened after that? I mean, everybody here knows. What happened? I ended up with a new time plus the old time. So you guys sat there, and I'm going to say you guys, because Common Council runs the CRB. Somebody actually took their key, went to the CRB, and messed around with the evidence that we gave to them. Like, let's just be frank. And it proved. You know why I proved it? Because at the CRB hearing, you had someone representing you there. You guys had someone representing you guys there. And the CRB had Clifford Ryan, I believe, or it was vice versa. But he was there, too, at my CRB hearing. And I specifically, and Runnett was there. So I don't understand how I get a different time off of something that even in news, because the news is the only person that has any other copy. And I gave them, like, they videotaped it in my living room back inside 2003. So I'm confused at how I get a time right here that says that they disappeared with him from the Justice Center at 9.06 p.m., ended up at Upstate Emergency Room at 10.18 10, p.m., and he died at 11.15 p.m. But up there on the, revert, on the revised time, it says that they only disappeared for six minutes. So, since you said that the Common Council is in charge of what the CRB. What year was it? Huh? What year? 2014. Helen, you already know this. Like, you already know. Because there's plenty, plenty of lawsuit papers across the hall for that videotape being messed with. But you're talking about a law department. But, but no, but listen, it. it does not matter because you were sitting on it. I ain't being directed to you because you're the one who brought me Barry Gerwald. You understand me? You did point me inside the right direction. You did lead me over there afterwards. But you did point me inside the right direction. But since you president, you got to sit down and talk to everybody. Who gave the authorization to make it seem like the police left six minutes with Eric? Because I know that they left for a, a one, they was gone one hour and six minutes, Helen, and you know this. And they all CRB you know, they is directed by Joey, it was directed by Joey and Renette. I don't have any. That wasn't even here then. Okay, Ronette so came it was into Joey. office. So it was Joey, the period. Joey took it to the color, to color industrial labs. Why would the president of the CRB go ahead and alter a videotape 
when he wanted, he, let me tell you something, the Bar City Ordinance Law, you want to know why that passed here, where we could go ahead and reopen up CRB cases? Because of my baby father, and Helen knows this, because I was here November 13th, 20, what was it, 2015? Well, 2013, when I buy something, this order law went into effect, where if nobody's case is investigated right by the CRB, that they're allowed to go ahead and reinvestigate it. That was off of my baby father in 13 years of sitting there saying, y'all killed him. So my question to you is, man, you, you became mayor after this. You said that you're going to implement him. I'm doing that. So what happened? Because on this, the recommendation says Officer 1 and 2 has to get retrained Retraining for officers one and two as it relates to volume, volume one, Article Four, Section One Point Zero Zero, Professional Standards of Conduct and Ethics, and is entirely with emphasis on Section One Point One Four, Performance and Attention to Duty. Maybe if you guys would have did the retraining in 2018, there would probably be less people shot by officers today. That's one, two. I told you to get Dennis Regan out. You didn't want to listen to me. So I wish my net was here because I know that I won a CRB case against Dennis Regan, the officer who beat up the two boys over there at Corcoran. I won that before he beat up them kids. He should have been retrained. Like, I, I want to meet their mom so bad so I could say, yo, up, your, up that, because the city was supposed to retrain him. I mean, I like you, I do. You help me a lot with my kids, you do. But over the years, I kept telling you not to call the police on my kids. Now do you understand why? Like, they killed my kids' father. Eric has no dad. Katwana has no dad. Cecilia has no dad. And Jamira has no dad because he was a black man. That's why they have no dad. So you have four kids go through this whole entire school district, which you overseen as deputy superintendent when Sharon was here and everything. But, I mean, if you really want to get frank, like, let's tell everybody the reason why the special ed kids got uh, mental health inside they, they IEPs now. Hmm? You, was, you was president of the board when I took my daughter's hearing to the school board hearing, right? Right? Jaime, didn't a white principal sit there and tell you that he's seen my daughter, Katwana, punch Mr. Um, what was the teacher's name up there? Nolan, Andrew Nolan. Brian Nolan's son. Didn't Andrew uh, Williams, Matthew Williams, who's principal, women, who's principal over there at Henniger right now, didn't he tell you that he seen my black daughter punch this white teacher seven times? I went out and I got a real lawyer, brought the real lawyer to the hearing. What happened at the school hearing, Jaime? Mean, you got a phone call from Yvonne. Oh, the white teacher can't remember telling deputy superintendent. And what happened? My daughter was still put on homebound. You guys voted to keep her on homebound. And she was never convicted of this teacher because it never happened. And you told me, yeah, no, he's lying. He's lying. He told me that. Because you yelled at me. You said, yo, Matthew said your daughter punched him seven times. And I said, no, my daughter never did that. And what happened? She never did. She never did. Or what about the fact when I found out that Matthew Williams, the same principal, was not letting the special ed kids... Yeah, special ed kids up there, father, go ahead and do the CT classes. Every child that was inside special ed, and there's multiple Hispanics and black kids that are special ed, what happened, Jaime? I had to fight for them, right, to get every, every kid up there, right? What happened when Eric was over there at Frazier? Huh? Then your officers, y'all got a call from the school, and what happened? Your officers took my son to CPAP. They gave him eight shots, eight, 50 milligrams of therazine. Do you know who gets therazine? Huh? Hmm? Criminals that's inside state penitentiaries or the people that stay inside of mental state hospitals. Those are good because therazine is a psychiatric drug. So what happened when I got up there? Damn, my son committed already. So I called the black principal over there at Frazier, Miss Pryor. And I said, Ms. Pryor, my son threatened you? She said, no, no, no. It took a black principal to tell the mental health staff over there at CPAP that the police was lying. By then, my son was already knocked out, shot up with eight, eight 50 milligrams, like eight. Like, I don't know what y'all problem is, 
but you supposed to sit there and then vote it for that, that second opinion doctor? We need that. You know why? Because he's not going to believe us every time that we get our ass whooped. Neither is he, neither is he, neither is she. I've been telling y'all that the police been sitting there whooping my kid's ass, and I tell you guys all the time, don't call the police. Hi, man. Tell them not to call the police. You know why? Do you know why? Because my kids stand freely and proudly and sit there and say seven white officers murdered they five. Do you remember when the school district allowed a teacher, Mrs. Joanne Graninelli, to go ahead and do a Syracuse.com report about my daughter who was in seventh grade, and y'all said my daughter was gang banging, y'all said she was gonna be nothing, y'all said that she was an animal. There was 192 comments when I sat there and called you and Sharon and told both of y'all to go ahead and eh, my black butt. And what happened? That same girl that y'all put down, that same little black girl with a disability, my daughter graduated last year with a regular high school fucking diploma. And what happened to what happened to the um, uh, no? What happened to them other little black kids? I had to find y'all. No. So let me tell you about this, what they do. Wait a minute. Listen. No, because this is important. I'm not saying it's not important. no. It is. But I'm listen. Not saying it's not All the be, listen. You know how many black kids are here inside this school district? Do you know how many? How many times did I have to sit there and call you, Jaime, and say, yo, Fowler guidance officers, well, counselors, who are all white, was hiding these black kids' credits? Because I'm the mother who made sure that Portia King's son and daughter graduated last year. I made sure that Frenisha got her diploma. And these ain't even my kids. These are not my kids. I don't understand because I've been told you. I've been told you that there's... Right, mad racial stuff going on inside the school district, honey. And you know my kids open up. I'm the one who got the governor, and you know that. I'm the one who made the governor bring in that lady, that doctor lady, to oversee all these suspension rates here inside Syracuse School District. I'm the one who asked, I'm the only one. Why is Eric's case listed as a homicide? Why is Eric's case listed as a homicide? Why? You guys said that you guys didn't kill him, right? He stuffed drugs up his butt, right? So why is this case listed as homicide? I'm going to tell you why. Because you guys didn't notify his mother, which gave you guys the opportunity to go ahead and do, and do an autopsy illegally because it, was not listed as, because it was listed as a homicide. So when, when you die and you're listed as a homicide, you get the autopsy. You guys really covered your ass, but I was just one smart woman to go ahead and keep pursuing it and everything. So my question is, is this. When Eric go back to school, is any of the teachers up there at Fowler going to mess with him? That's my question. Is y'all going to beat him? Because we already know Katwana got her ass whooped. Right, Jaime? Right? Am I lying? Did your, did your security guards whoop Katwana inside, what, December of 2016 when I was at Janesville and y'all knew I was at Janesville doing the bid? Let's just be real. Does my daughter have a permit gash on her face? Did all the SOR... Um, Officers had to get retrained when my daughter was in seventh grade over there at Lincoln because you know that you, Brian, and Tom all sat there and watched this security guard bang my daughter who was in seventh grade. You know that you've seen him bang Katwana up there on the, on the thing, the vending machines inside Lincoln Middle, uh, Lincoln Cafeteria. And what did we see, honey? I mean, we seen him go ahead and poke Katwana like that and drag my baby like this to the office, but she was an animal, right? And y'all know what happened when I took my baby to the emergency room. How the fuck does a seventh grader end up with a fucking car whiplash when she's in school and a fucking security officer did it? How does my baby end up with that? So that's like, how many, like, I, for real, I got 10 kids. I have 10 kids, I mean, how many times we had a conversation about y'all teachers and everything lying on these black kids and not even only mine because you get phone calls from me, Ronnie Griffin, about all kids, correct? Correct? I complain about kids that I, like, come on now, that's messed up. You, I know you said, you told me last year that this is all new and everything because you, you came here. So let me go ahead and ask you something. You going to retrain them officers? Because I just told you that they was ordered to go ahead and be retrained by the CRB. You going to retrain them? Because I'm also the one who sat there last month and put up the videotape of the three, three officers that killed my baby father. I watched them bring a black man outside, no underwears, no socks and nothing. 
So Iman sat there, hit me up like, yo, Yvonne, I just talked to the chief. He said that they put a code on Word? They put a code on him? No, they didn't. And I sent Ima the whole entire video. I was the one who recorded that. That was kind of messed up. I seen three officers who were supposed to be off of this force harassing another black man. Would you like it? You a black man. Would you like it if they brought you out there with no socks on? You have no boxes on. You have no shirts on. I know you didn't have nothing because I'm the one who put the video out there. So what are you going to do about that? Because mind you, these are three of the same cops who done killed a black man. And I was able to prove it. What you going to do? What, what you going to do? This is your city. What you going to do for these cops? Because I have yet to be apologized to. My kids have been like no apologies at all. You as a common counsel, what are we going to do about the CRB? Because I'm going to tell you what, Helen, you know that the CRB was already approved to go ahead and get that second opinion medical person. Yvonne. You know that. Yvonne. We was approved and granted that in extra money way back in site 2013 when Joseph was here. Yvonne. You know that. So, I'm, no, this is an ongoing thing. You know why? Because Eric died in 2002. I want to offer, I want to offer you something. You, okay, you have a, you have, you've made a formal request of, to, I understand that. I understand that, and I'm offering a way to, to help heal that pain by, I believe that you have a, a formal request with my office for a meeting, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, in, out of respect for everyone here and their families, please allow me to t continue this conversation with you offline in, in the form of a meeting. I'll have somebody follow up with you uh, on Monday when the office is back open, we'll set something up and we'll continue this conversation respectfully. All right, so I have one question. Eric died in 2002. I did a notice of claim in 2003. Everybody knows that you got like one and a half, two years to go ahead and bring up a lawsuit, correct? My lawsuit was denied inside 2003. So I don't understand how after I won the CRB hearing, Todd hits me up like, yo, you ready to do this lawsuit? Like, I'm dead ass serious, right here. Let's continue the conversation next week. Right here, pursuant to general municipal, like I don't understand that. I didn't even, I didn't even ask the city lawyers to go ahead and reopen my case because I know it's a dead issue. Like we don't want no money. What we want is to be treated fairly like everybody else. There should be no reason why I gotta tell Eric, yo, don't run outside because you're gonna, I don't wanna bury another Eric. He never seen, never got to see big, big Eric. I was three months pregnant with my son. I have Eric's only son. He was born on Father's Day. He was born 11 days after his father's birthday. Like, you guys done beat little Eric's ass so bad and then shoving, like, you guys just, like, take all these black kids and just shove Therazine up their ass like they just fucking crazy. No. What the issue is, he would be more better if his daddy was alive. Understood. How about that? Understood. I've, now, continue. do you understand what be going on with my kids? Like, do you seriously understand, Jaime? I mean? Now, do you understand... Miss uh, Board President, why I sat there and took my, kid, my daughter's case? You left my daughter on homebound because a white teacher and a white principal lied to the, to the superintendent. He's superintendent now, but he was definitely superintendent then. So, we, like, under, we understand, Yvonne, and, and, and I want to continue For real, because I'm, I'm about to tell all the secrets of the city. I wanna, I wanna and find out, please, tell me. Like, I want to know who went in there and changed... My day. I was incarcerated. There's no way. I was incarcerated from October of 2016 to February 2017. They altered my stuff. How can I go ahead and do a complaint? And why, why would I go ahead and do a complaint? Why would I do it again in 2017 when the incident happened in 02? Well, I will admit, but I don't have any keys to the CRB office. Well, there's a whole lot of common counsels up there. They don't have keys to that office. Really? Who got keys to the office? Raynet. Yvonne no, before Raynette. Who, it was three people worked in CRB. Because mm -hmm. the only one, Joseph was the only one. It was Joseph. Ronette, Ronette. listen, Helen. I didn't say Ronette, I said Betty. Betty worked in Betty was office. there, he, she was a secretary, and Joseph was the CRB president. Other than that, you guys took out the investigators that Felicia Davis had when she was there. That's a whole different story. Okay, so what we're going so what we're going to say is that there's two people who had keys to the CRB board. So find out which one sat there and decided to go ahead and do this. Because I still think it was a, I, I think it was the mayor's office. I think it was somebody here. Because why would the CRB be hurting? Why would they go ahead and hurt my case? They here to help us. Where's the investigators at? So you want one person, one person looking over a hundred reports. One person, where's the investigators? Then they get money? 
They got money inside a inside a, a little grant thing that they do every year. I know that much because I work with the CRB very closely. So I want to know what happened to the medical examiner and what happened to that ten thousand dollars. They were supposed to get five thousand for for the investigators and five thousand for the medical examiner. So that way, if she gets beat up by the police, she makes a report to CRB. It I goes to that second opinion right doctor. Yvonne. That's a question for Yvonne, respectfully. Oh well, I'll be here at the next. Let, one. We'll, we'll talk next uh, week. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I think I think I think the 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 problem that her story articulates is the process not working adequately, the process not hearing people's concerns, and how do you make sure that there's accountability? And I think the challenge is that when there are issues of accountability, it is not explicit as to how those issues will be addressed. I think it demonstrates why there's a concern for the need to have police and really citizen oversight over the police department, Understood. particularly around issues around enforceability. Understood. I think we have to end. We have to end because not only have we exceeded time, but we have to end because really we want to make sure that we reiterate what the focus that we were here today to talk about. We put forward a series of demands that articulated a number of challenges that we've seen in the community, challenges that are about the public health and safety of the community, challenges about reimagining and transforming the way with which law enforcement engages with community, challenging in the power that we've imbalanced in our community by giving so much power and authority to law enforcement, and by ensuring that when there are issues and incidents around enforcement of police misconduct, that we don't allow the process to delay action. What has happened in the case of Citizen Review Board, what has happened in the case of SROs, what have happened in the case of a number of issues with respect to citizen police encounters has demonstrated that the types of reforms that have been put forward previously are not adequate. They're not requisite of the types of challenges that the community is facing, and it doesn't rise to the moment that we're in today. And I thank the people who have come here to share their stories, because it's not easy to do that. There's a lot of pain and trauma in those stories. I think we recognize and acknowledge that there are efforts that are being made, but those efforts do not exceed where we have to be at. I think TJ really said it best when asked the question that I tried to make sure that we circled back to, we understand that there's process that has to happen, but we don't think that should change your ability to understand and endorse something that you believe is wrong. You, of course, have to figure out the process. You have to, of course, figure out how to get there. That's recognized, it's realized, it's understood. But committing to making sure that those issues are implemented and addressed is what the urgency requires of us. Each of your respective offices has a specific level of responsibility and has a specific role to collectively address those issues. I think that the people here have spoken to all those issues, have articulated the broad issues, have recognized the need to make sure that the work is done, and has tried to reassert the record so that the public has a greater understanding as to why we are calling for what we're calling and what change looks like. We cannot continue to do the same things and expect different results. We have to rise to this moment. Nationally, and in fact internationally, we're seeing that people are saying enough is enough. What are we doing in the city of Syracuse to make sure that we rise to that occasion? What are we doing in the city of Syracuse to not just address the problems that happen across the country, but are happening, have happened, and without the types of changes that we're talking about will continue to happen? It is incumbent upon you all in your positions to do what you can within your respective positions, but we believe that everyone here has some accountability that has to happen. And that's what we're here to call people to do. We're here to be clear, to say that we are gonna to begin to demand and make sure we continue to hold accountability. We are gonna to begin to be explicit. As we say in the community, we got the receipts. We've done the research, we've got the boards, we've got the budgets, We've looked at the different issues, we've collected the stories, we've shared them. And now it is incumbent upon you all, and you got two weeks, to begin to talk about collectively amongst each other what you're gonna do. But we expect that that response is gonna be in response to the urgency of the moment that we find ourselves in today. It's not enough to do reform. It's just not. Reform hasn't been working. It hasn't been working and it's not gonna work. We have to transform the relationship that exists. 
and can no longer subsidize suburban communities, whether in schools or with policing. We can no longer allow misconduct to happen, whether from SROs in schools or police officers in the community. We cannot allow the conversation to shift from police accountability to the fictitious idea of black-on-black -black crime. We cannot allow victim to be placed at expense for another victim. We're saying that we're not doing that anymore, that the tactics of old are ending today, and that the community is going to continue in coalition to work towards those efforts. It is not easy to get 15 organizations to agree to anything, let alone nine things. And to be clear about every single one of them, the amount of hours that these folks have put in, I want to give you all credit because of the effort that has been taken to make sure that we articulate them and then give you guys the opportunity to respond. There's a new day in the city of Syracuse. To the community who's watching, we want you to know that we hear you, we've seen you, we're working with you, we're gonna make sure that we continue to engage you, continue to bring you into the process, continue to talk about these issues, continue to make sure that we demand something different and realize and recognize that now is our moment. We can't delay, we can't obfuscate, we can't redirect. We've gotta be razor focused. So please, come join the efforts of these groups. I wanna to talk to Q's Youth BLM, join them and support them. Raha Syracuse. BLM, BLM Syracuse, National Action Network Syracuse, Syracuse Police Accountability Reform Coalition, Syracuse Peace Council, Alliance of Communities Transforming Syracuse, Black Leadership Coalition. Who else am I forgetting? Last Chance for Change. Who else is out there? CNY Solidarity. I don't know who the rebirth is, but we get back. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to them. We'll talk to them too the New York Civil Liberties Union, and there are others who are a part of this process. We're going to make sure that we have those groups represented, and we thank you all for affording us the opportunity. Have a good night. Thank you.